Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here today for World Horse Welfare's conference, which in a first for the charity, uh, we embrace change in these very strange times. This is truly a hybrid event with guests here in London and quite a few of you as well at the Royal Geographical Society and also hundreds of guests who are attending the conference virtually online. Uh, welcome to everybody here in the room and to all of you tuning in across the UK and indeed to the wider world. I guess I would say good day to you all. For the first time, we're also offering guests the opportunity to listen to today's event in Spanish or French. And if you wish to do so, please simply follow the instructions at worldhorsewelfare.org slash conference or here on this slide. Now, to make sure our in-person and virtual guests can participate in the discussion, we're asking for all questions to be submitted through Slido, through the Q&A function on the Slido screen. I'm losing myself already here, but I'm sure you know what, to, what you're doing. You'll have received the link and the passcode in your email invitations. And for the, those of you in the theater today, use the Slido app on your phone, or if you don't have it, ask your next door neighbor, and log in with a passcode that you got on your printed program. Sounds easy, doesn't it? If you do not have a phone, uh, please raise your hand to get the attention of the two members of staff here. Where are my two members of staff? There they are. There are the ladies here um, who will help out with, with the questions that you want to pose. So for those of you watching on YouTube, please do post any questions you can on YouTube, and we will try to get to those as well. Uh, the discussion will also be taking place on Twitter, and we're using the hashtag today, Whose Opinions Matter? I hope you'll all join in on the conversation, but for those of us in the theatre, do please to remember to have your mobile phones on silent. Thank you very much. So we're trying a few new ways of working today. Fingers crossed it'll all work very smoothly, and everybody we hope can take part. Today we consider the potentially thorny question of whose opinion matters. This is sure to generate plenty of opinion. Uh, to get us started, we would like your views, so would you please complete the following poll. You will need to click on the poll tab in Slido in the top right hand corner. So our first poll question uh, is, which of the following play the most important role in shaping your opinions, your opinions on horse related matters? Is it scientific evidence, experienced people in the industry, of which there are many here today? Uh, would it be from Dr. Google or Equine Media, books, family and friends? Other owners at, the, at your yard, your past experience, social media or others? So there's lots of things to, uh, to, for you to consider there. Just, just, just what you think reshapes your opinions on horse-related matters. Now, just on a bit of protocol here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please just bear with me while I talk about this uh, COVID safety measures in place we've got here. We've got plenty of hand sanitizer points, and there's been a more frequent cleansing of uh, common areas, and RGS staff will be wearing masks and encourage others to do so, but this is very much your personal choice. Now, the current terror threats level is substantial at the moment, uh, two levels down from the most serious, but still pretty significant, no less. So we have security precautions in place to ensure that we keep everybody, every one of you safe. So do please make sure to wear your name badge and ensure it's visible at all times. And in case of fire, the alarm will sound, you should leave the building, every entrance and exit to the theater is clearly marked as a fire exit, and once outside, uh, theatre guests should make their way to the nearest exit on street level. The meeting point is in front of the Royal Albert Hall. Uh, that's where you should make your way in, in the unlikely scenario we have to use that. And we have fire marshals as well to assist the RGS staff to help you, point you in the right direction. First aid as well, we've got that covered. If a first aid emergency occurs, please inform reception immediately. Uh, and a first aid room is facing the cloakroom next to the ladies' toilets. Now though, after all that, we can get on with the most important things of the day. Uh, now we're going to show you a video called Charity in Action. Are we showing that video? Maybe we're not. 
Maybe, maybe it's later on. Okay, let's uh, move on then. Um, <laughs> During the morning break, I did warn you, Rowley, didn't I? Uh, our virtual audience will be treating, uh, treated to three intriguing presentations showing how World Horse Welfare's uh, harnesses opinion to improve the welfare of horses and how you can use your own opinion to, indeed to influence that change as well. Uh, these presentations will be playing on in the Education Centre during the break, so our guests here today in the theatre will not miss out on those that those at home can, can see. We've also uh, got some donation envelopes today as well. We are so grateful for all of your support. I'd like to draw your attention to the donation envelope within your program. Just give what you can afford, ladies and gentlemen, and every donation is gratefully received. Finally, I'd like to reiterate our thanks to the conference's sponsors, the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust for helping to make this event possible, as well as the support from the Horse Racing Betting Levy Board and Keeping Britain's Horses Healthy for their generous backing in this event as well. So thank you to all, and we're privileged to have a message indeed from Nigel Payne, who is the trustee of the Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust to open this event. Nigel, if you'd like to come to the stage, welcome. We'll do that with pleasure, Nigel. There you go. There we go. Pleasure, mate. Okay. Your Royal Highness, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, um, had, had this um, taken place a week ago, you would have thought that you had found the, uh, the real beast of Bodmin, because I only had my hair cut three days ago, <coughs> and it had got very long. The second point is, of course, that Rowley said to me, you, I've given you five minutes, but uh, we are tight for time, so don't you dare take five minutes. <laughs> now, I, I'm very frightened of Rowley, so obviously I won't take five minutes. But it's wonderful for Peter's Trust to be able to sponsor this wonderful conference again. and. Uh, is something that we shall continue to do. When Peter set up his trust in 1998, after retiring from the BBC, one of the six charities he chose to support was World Horse Welfare, or actually the International League for the Protection of Horses, it was known then. It was remarkable, you probably all know this anyway, but Peter retired having commentated on 50 consecutive Grand Nationals, which is amazing. Now, the ethos of World Horse Welfare and the vital importance it places on equines worldwide and the responsible use of horses in sport was everything Peter valued and wished to support. And now, of course, with the growth and development of equine-assisted therapy, this is yet another example of how these magnificent creatures are so relevant in today's society. Indeed, we help them, but they can jolly well help us too. And they are so wonderful when used in, in the therapy world. Our trust has set up, a, or is setting up <coughs> a human equine research register whereby we can create a national database of all those organizations offering equine-assisted therapy. Uh, we must make this available to everyone, particularly in these terrible times of mental health problems, and it must be available whenever needed. Lives can truly be saved. And I'm totally committed to the aftercare review commissioned by the Horse Welfare Board. You know, we really must be responsible for our horses from, uh, from cradle to grave. Now, the theme of your conference is whose opinion matters. Well, my answer is whichever way the subject is debated, the horse must come first. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Nigel. Um, now I'd like to introduce the Chairman of World Horse Welfare, Michael Baines, who will say a few words. Uh, 
Thank you, Mike. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, what an absolute delight uh, to be back here to welcome you all on behalf of World Horse Welfare to our conference of 2021. Um, I must first thank Nigel uh, and the Peter O'Sullivan Trust, uh, who do so much for horse sport and for sponsoring this conference. So it, it, it's very good of you. Um, I'm sorry Jeffrey can't be here, but I think he's preparing for a exhibition. So if I'm allowed to plug the Osborne Gallery, I'm plugging it. Um, now, I, ho I do hope those of you who, who actually aren't here but are, are, are online can hear and see are, and are ready to participate and answer those questions. Um, it's going to be a fascinating morning. After all, who doesn't have an opinion? Be it driven by experience, emotion, reason, or sometimes unreason. Um, do animals have opinions? Um, if we ever have a difference of opinion with our horses, they usually win, as far as I can, certainly in my experience, anyway. Um, but why now? Why is it particularly important that opinions matter more than ever, and that as far as animal welfare is concerned, getting those opinions right and promoting them at the right time is so crucial? In the dim, distant past, even before the internet, most of us found our knowledge from books and known experts, and you know, we, we, we respected authority, uh, which was good and bad, and it, but it made life much easier. Now with the internet, and social media particularly, um, which is usually for the better, but sometimes for worse, instant access to all sorts of information and opinions is so easy. The growth of fake news, I hear you think. For instance, and this is a, you know, you, you'll all have your own experience of, of things that have amazed you. For instance, would hundreds of thousands of people have been encouraged to take Invermectin, I think I've got it right, that well-known uh, drug for parasites, as a means of preventing or curing COVID? And you only have to check the internet to, actually, you know, to see that it was promoted not only by the anti-vaxxers, but actually by some, some, some countries, excuse me. It's not just that there was no sound evidence that Invermectin was effective, an effective therapeutic, but that some opinion forms went out of their way to promote highly questionable and unsound research in support, with in some cases, sadly, lethal results. Surely an example of bad opinion made much worse through the use of modern communications. World Horse Welfare prides itself in seeking informed, in seeking informed and evidence-based opinion, be it from our staff, our trustees, our committees of external experts, or from our patrons. As you will hear later from Jordan when she speaks, our grooms and field officers have learned exceptional skills in how to deal with distressed and vulnerable equines whilst our veterinary committee reads like a who's who of global authorities in equine veterinary medicine. Through this conference and other events, we at World Horse Welfare actively seek to bring people together to share information and opinions. Horse owners, communities across the globe, vets, academia, governments, NGOs. We engage on many levels with our sister charities, but also with the British Horse Council, British Equestrian, the FEI, Eurogroup for Animals, European Horse Network, the International for Coalition for Animal Welfare, the International Coalition for Working Equids, and the World Federation for Animals. And I'm delighted that some of those representatives are here today. In this way, we get our opinions across, but we also learn to help to ensure through those meetings, that our views are not only compassionate and practical, but well-informed and up-to-date. Now, you would think that no one would listen to us if our opinions were not based on best current knowledge and evidence. But sadly, and as my example of using Infomectin has shown, that in the modern world, this is not always true. 
and taking the example of Invermectin, the promotion of false or poorly researched solutions can do significant damage. And through social media, media, that lie can be maintained for much longer than previously. This means that not only do we need our research to be sound and evidence-based, that we must also invest in the proactive promotion of that research through education and other means of communication. As an example, and true to our founding aims, this charity is investing in the first dedicated international research into equine welfare at slaughter, which will lead to published guidance for more humane practices in the abattoirs. A timely initiative, I would suggest. A further example in the, is the recent launch, along with the Royal Veterinary College, of an ethical framework for horse sport. The first workshop attracted 100 participants from elite equestrian sports and the racing industry to consider those ethical challenges in their sports and how a framework might help them ground their, their decision making on sound foundations. My point in mentioning these initiatives is not only are they timely, but if the, we who have the knowledge don't remain proactive, others with less knowledge and less understanding and perhaps some other agenda and certainly less knowledge of the welfare and ethical issues are likely to take the initiative. We have to remember that the tide of opinion is always changing and that if we aren't proactive, someone else will take the strain. Now, where have I got to? Um, excuse me. So we risk the risk of, fall we, 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 there's a risk of falling behind. So today we will consider opinions through different perspectives, how they can be used for better or worse, and I hope shed some light on whose opinion really matters. And now to set this scene uh, and to get things going, there's a short film. Thank you very much. Do we have the film? <laughs> Thank you. It's long been known that horses bring out many different opinions in humans. Through the ages, different methods of horsemanship have long been debated. And today, the sheer volume of opinion can be both overwhelming and deafening. Strong views can be found wherever horses meet people. But who should we listen to? On yards, at competitions, in riding schools, and out hacking, everyone has an opinion on how to better manage horses, ponies, donkeys, and mules. But should they influence us? And then there are those who believe that we should not be managing horses at all that we should not ride them, or compete them, or involve them in any activity with people. How do we respond to their opinions? With the rise in online forums, blogs, social media, and video sharing all competing for our attention, how do we know that a source of information is trustworthy, and how easily can we take a snapshot in time out of context, or misinterpret what we see, and declare judgment? Also, lurking in some of these communities are the online trolls, people looking to humiliate and embarrass. What motivates them? And how can we avoid these disruptive influences? In horse sport, welfare has again sparked fierce debate in the media, from that photo of Gordon Elliott, to treatment of horses in modern pentathlon at the Olympics, to revelations around treatment of retired racehorses in Panorama. Mark Twain once famously wrote, it is the difference of opinion that makes horse races, but whose opinion is setting the agenda for equestrian sport? When it comes to influencing the key decision makers, locally, nationally, globally, what is the role of objective evidence in shaping policy? And what should it be 
Is objective evidence enough to inform the right decisions? What is the value of experience or common sense? And when, if ever, should opinion overrule fact? Who is best to advise us on our horses? Do we focus too much on looking at each aspect of our horse's well-being in separation? Could we do more to look at the whole of the horse in the round? Are some voices not heard due to cultural beliefs or stigmas in communities around the world? Could the horse-human partnership become stronger if these opinions are more widely understood? And how often do we truly listen to our horses? What are they trying to tell us? We all have our own individual opinions. But how open are we to views that challenge our own way of seeing? How can we best ensure that our own opinions are informed by fact, rather than just emotions or habits? Can we be more open-minded to change? This year, we will explore whose opinion matters. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Horse Welfare Conference 2021. Michael, thank you very much for those uh, thought-provoking words. And the, and the film, I think, just outlines why we're here uh, today. Now, I think we've got the results of that poll that we, uh, well, I hope we have, that we took earlier, see whether our technology works or not. We asked you about what influences your opinion. What have we got? There we go. Which of the following play the most important role in shaping your opinions on equine-related matters? And it was a pretty close-run thing between scientific evidence and experienced people in the industry. But um, I wonder whether, is, did, did social media register on the scale at all? Maybe, perhaps it didn't. Um, no, it didn't, did it? Not on this occasion, anyway. So scientific evidence and consulting experienced people in the industry, fascinating. Now let's hear from Roly Owers, uh, World Horse Welfare's uh, view. Um, from his point of view, Roly, welcome back. It's great to see you and thank you for staging this fascinating conference. Nigel Payne's glass of water. There we go. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, Michael asked us whether animals have opinions, and I just love the horse that's looking over the gate there. I'm fairly sure he's got an opinion. But anyway, I'm delighted to welcome you to our first truly hybrid international conference to consider the question, whose opinion matters? When choosing the theme for today, we did wonder whether we really want to enter into this lion's den. But it's too important a question not to. Opinion is everywhere, and whether we like it or not, it shapes our attitudes and drives our decisions, and not just in the horse world. In the UK, in the past few days, we have seen significant reverberations in politics and cricket, where decisions were made that did not sufficiently consider public opinion, which were quickly followed by decisions made in direct reaction to a now angry public opinion. We see this kind of reaction in the horse world too, especially in sport, but also in microcosm anywhere horses and people meet. But is the court of public opinion the right one to set the agenda, or the opinion of the loudest person on the yard, or the person with the most followers? To unpack this, let's first consider the definition of opinion, which can be defined as a view or judgment formed about something not necessarily based on fact or knowledge, or a statement of advice by an expert on a professional matter. 
For me, these provide intriguingly different perspectives. Considering the first definition, there is certainly, as Michael has said, plenty of uninformed opinion out there. This has always existed, but now it is easier than ever to be shared and snowball into an avalanche of misinformation and abuse. These opinions usually generate more heat than light. Social media loves righteousness. It loves anger. And bite-sized bombs of judgment can be dreamed up in an instant and delivered with a click. But do these opinions really matter? Unfortunately, in some ways, they do. Uninformed opinion can have a serious impact on people and on important decisions. Consider all the misinformation about COVID vaccines, about ivermectin. But there are so many examples of the detrimental effect that dubious claims and rushes to judgment can have on others, including those on, in the public eye, but also on people like us. And I look forward to hearing a personal story from one of our former grooms, Jordan Headspeeth, after coffee, as well as tips from performance coach Charlie Unwin on how to remain resilient in the face of these onslaughts. One recent high-profile example is, uh, was in this season's Bake Off. A young vegan woman was forced off Facebook because she rides. One commentator apparently wrote, please don't say that you are passionate about ethics when you still ride horses. We completely disagree with this frankly bizarre assertion. So often, if someone says there is only one way to do something, this is simply not true. Besides, critics of the horse-human partnership do not hold a monopoly on ethics. And all of us in the horse world need to consider and demonstrate the ethics behind this most special relationship. Similarly, at the Olympics this summer, there were some difficult scenes, including the disturbing footage in modern pentathlon. These all deserved a reaction, but not the loud calls from some to completely ban so-called abusive equestrian sports from the Olympics. Now, just last week, we heard that the regulator of modern pentathlon has apparently decided to remove the horse riding element from their sport. No one could condone what happened at this year's Olympics. But the issue wasn't that the horses were being ridden, but how the horses were being ridden, together with the rules of the competition. In our view, the UIPM have made the wrong decision. Let's remember that systemic misguided opinion has systemic effects. As we say, see in the case of working horses, donkeys and mules, who are still too undervalued and invisible to policymakers. The vital part they play in human livelihoods, in the environment and in sustainability is still unconsidered, even by those who live in the countries where these animals already make such a difference something we and our friends at the Donkey Sanctuary have been working to address at COP26. However, it is really reassuring that the World Organization for Animal Health has working equids firmly on their radar, and we are delighted that their Director General, Do Dr. Monique Elois, will speak to us shortly about the importance of evidence in decision-making. Which brings us to our second definition of opinion, one based on fact and knowledge. This is the type of opinion that we truly believe in. In fact, we would go as far to say that not basing opinions on facts or knowledge is simply irresponsible. As the American writer Harlan Ellison said, you are not entitled to your opinion. You are entitled to your informed opinion. No one is entitled to be ignorant. After all, we trust our experts, our dentists, our vets, our farriers, and their views are based on knowledge and fact. Imagine if they didn't base their opinions on fact. Would their opinions matter then? Where we can run into trouble sometimes is that a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing. We pick up one piece of information and apply it in another context. Or we see a few pieces of the puzzle and assume we have the whole picture. This can lead to misjudgments, sloppy assumptions, and a glint of credibility that can misdirect far too easily, 
on both sides. It's easy to be outraged about an equine euthanasia on a course and damn horse sports as cruel. But it's also easy for horse sport or any one of us to dismiss an argument by pointing to the relative ignorance of the accuser and brush their criticism aside. Uncomfortable reality must be examined and addressed by all of us when we are challenged, no matter who by. Some of our critics will be knowledgeable, some less so, but their opinions still matter. And it is great that Pammy Houghton is with us today to give her view on the role of opinion in equestrianism. The media play a pivotal role in shaping opinion and in interpreting it, as we will hear from Ed Chamberlain shortly. This year has seen a groundswell of indignation within the sport among the, and among the public following the headlines around Gordon Elliott and Panorama. Some focus their attention on the source or the slant of the stories, rather than the uncomfortable facts behind them. But these uncomfortable facts are a wake-up call for all horse sports, that their responsibilities to horses apply any time, anywhere, and that they are accountable to the public. But we should banish this idea that we are in some kind of existential tug of war, that if we make changes based on evidence, that this is the thin edge of the wedge through giving ground to the opposition and antis. This will be simply a self-fulfilling prophecy. For horse sport to maintain its social license, we must proactively make the right choices for our horses, which includes standing firm and justifying with facts when we feel changes don't need to be made. Sorry. And then what about our experience, our common sense? Isn't that evidence enough? For sure, these are vital that they can no longer be used alone as justification. Today, we need to include objective evidence, preferably tested by science. So, whose opinion matters? Without doubt, it is your opinion that matters, because it constantly feeds your values and your actions, and only you can do something about it. And if your opinion matters, you have a responsibility to have an informed one. It's only opinions not based on fact and evidence that crumble under scrutiny. Houses of straw get blown down by the big bad wolf. But if our actions and decisions are informed, we have nothing to fear by checking our own behavior and calmly explaining ourselves. In fact, we should welcome be being challenged and should strive to be more accepting of others' perspectives. As the American poet Waldo Emerson once said, let me never fall into the vulgar mistake of dreaming that I am persecuted whenever I am contradicted. We can only get the right answer or change our behavior to improve how we act if we are informed. And we need to be open to change our minds when the facts change. Equally, we should not ignore the opinions of others, as this will help us understand how we can work with them where needed to change their attitudes and behavior. And just because there are two different opinions doesn't always mean that one of them is wrong. There are different ways of training a horse to get the same result, and different horses respond to different approaches. In basing our opinions on knowledge, it is important that we have a logical process in our decision making. This is very much at the heart of our project with the Royal Veterinary College, as Michael mentioned, to develop an, a, an ethical framework for horse sport, launched last month, to help make decisions considering evidence, the law, and the opinions of others. We should also not be afraid to put our opinions out there. We don't have to be afraid of the big bad wolf so long as the foundations of our thinking are built in brick. The court of public opinion can make it feel like mob rule, but it, this is far more likely if we are unprepared or ill-informed.
Without doubt, an informed opinion will help us keep on the straight and narrow towards our ultimate goals, so we do not get blown down or sidetracked along the way. It can give us the confidence and security to look at ourselves objectively. Opinion backed by evidence may not solve all the problems, but it will certainly take us further forward, beyond the tug of war, beyond the big bad wolf, and help ensure we are truly doing the best for our horses. As one of the big three science fiction writers, Isaac Asimov, once said, your assumptions are your windows on the world. Scrub them off once in a while, or the light won't come in. Now it is more important than ever that everyone who cares about horses generates less heat and more light. Thank you very much indeed. Broly, that was absolutely passionately delivered as always. There were some interesting slides up there. The black and white picture of the doctor and his patient scared me more than the big bad wolf. I can certainly tell you that. Um, thank you so much, really. I really appreciate that. Um, now, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the most influential leaders in animal health and welfare. Dr. Monique Eloy is Director General of the World Organization for Animal Health, or O. IE, as they say in France, which was established to fight animal diseases globally and the intergovernmental organization responsible for improving animal health and increasingly welfare worldwide. So let's hear now from Dr. Monique Eloi. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank World Health Welfare for inviting me for a keynote on how the OIE relies on expertise, evidence, and data. I'm sorry not be, to be with you in person today, but thanks to technology, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to make this presentation. Dear participants, our fellow citizens are increasingly worried about the future of our Well, wow. ladies and gentlemen, well, <laughs> I would like to thank World Health Welfare for inviting me for a keynote on how the OIE relies on expertise, evidence, and data. I'm sorry not be, to be with you in person today, but thanks to technology, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to make this presentation. Dear participants, our fellow citizens are increasingly worried about the future of our planet, climate change, overconsumption of resources, pollution of our environment, and of course, the risk of pandemics. So many challenges and concerns in today's accelerating world. More and more people want to return to practices that are more respectful of our environment and human well-being. They expect proposals to improve our daily lives, while at the same time being dubious about scientific progress. In addition, thanks to the access to numerous platforms, some consider themselves an expert in having opinions on everything, regardless of their level of education to understand, the, to understand the information. But that is no new, only more prominent today due to social media. It is for this reason that it is necessary to continue to base our positions on accurate and robust scientific analysis, but also to find the appropriate wording to communicate in order to avoid misunderstandings approximation or worth misinformation. In many of your respective countries, this concern has been addressed over the recent years by splitting the scientific evaluation devoted to specialized agencies from the risk management under the legal responsibility of the authorities. The OIE has of course considered this context and adjust its practices. Today, I would like to share with you some thoughts on this matter and present to you how we deal with these issues of evidence in our daily work. Let me firstly remind that the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, was established in 1924 with a two-fold mandate to collect and publish worldwide sanitary information notified by the members in order to inform all the parties interested in training animals and animal products 
about the trends of disease. And secondly, to set standards to ensure a safer trade and more broadly to improve the prevention and control of animal diseases. Thus, since its inception as intergovernmental organization, the OIE prides itself on being a science-driven organization. In this respect, the recognition of our scientific impartiality was made by WTO members in 1995 when they adopted the Sanitary and Phytosanitary Agreement, the SPS Agreement, by which the OIE was recognized as the International Standard Setting Organization for Animal Health and Zoonosis. Any dispute about animal health leading to a complaint before WTO involved the OIEs, which provides scientific input to clarify the ins and outs of the dispute. Animal welfare-related matters are not considered by this SPS agreement yet. But why not, in the future, if we recall the dispute between Canada and the European Commission about the import and marketing of seal products? Over the years, our programs have diversified, but always with the same major objective, namely improving the sustainability of animal production. Indeed, while one of the sustainable development goals is zero hunger, we have to keep in mind that insufficient access to food, zoonoses and foodborne diseases still impact millions of people worldwide. With 18% of the world's population engaged in animal husbandry or in the processing and marketing of animal-based foods, these people's livelihoods and socio-economic status depend on the health of animals. But this objective must be reconsidered in the light of other challenges such as climate change, food consumption patterns, and animal welfare, along with increased expectation for more environmentally friendly animal production. However, the OIE has neither the mandate nor the resources to implement such ambitions on the ground. This is why supporting the veterinary services of our 182 members is crucial. They must be supported to be more robust, sustainable, and resilient to respond to so many challenges in a so rapidly changing world. The current OIE 7 strategic plan shares a global vision and a framework for action plan for 2021-2025. It has been designed and structured on the achievements made in the previous strategic plan, of course. Without presenting the plan in all its detail, I would like to highlight some of its components. Firstly, we have to recall the principle guiding our engagement, namely scientific excellence, independence, transparency, solidarity, and partnership. Then, our strategic plan is structured in five key chapters, and the first one being dedicated to scientific expertise. To support the implementation of this objective, the OIE progressively built a specific science system encompassing four specialist commissions, two working groups, one on antimicrobial resistance and the other on wildlife, temporary ad hoc groups, as well as an amazing network of reference laboratories and collaborating centers. Before any election or nomination, all applications are assessed against specific criteria and according to standard operating procedures. Then, the work undertaken by these commissions and groups of experts is conducted in complete independence. It is my responsibility as OIDG to protect this scientific independence from any external pressure, whether political or economic. To complete the own expertise of the members of our commissions and groups, the OIE makes available to them data produced by several in-house sources, in particular the information collected through the World Animal Health Information System, WISE, which are interesting to follow the evolution of the diseases in time and in their geographical expansion. But information on disease is not sufficient to understand the realities on the ground, which is important to better target the issues we we'll need to work on as a priority. This is why we are engaged in two ambitious programs, the OI Observatory and GBAT for Global Burden of Animal Disease. The first program, the OIE Observatory. While the development of standards is a central mission for, for the OIE, the organization must also look at 
how they are used, how they are implemented by members. Monitoring the implementation will enable us to identify and analyze the difficulties faced by our members and better support them. The OI Observatory aims to ensure that the standards developed are relevant and fit for purpose and to adapt capacity building activities to member needs or member expectations. The second program is, I would like to introduce here is GBADS, a multi partner program. The objective of GBADS is to roll out a framework on measuring animal health burdens and their impact on human lives and economies. Catering socioeconomic data is crucial because we know that decision makers lack the information to accurately assess whether the investments target the animal health issues that have the most significant impact on human well-being. Finally, at the end of the whole process and having used all the data at our disposal, the draft standards and recommendations are submitted to the consideration of the Assembly and they are based only and solely on scientific knowledge. It is then up to the members to adopt or reject these drafts, taking into account other considerations as it has been done for the chapter on laying ends submitted at the last general session in May 2021. Now, specifically to animal welfare, a few words. Since 2002, the OIE, at the request of members, became the global leader in the development of international standards in animal welfare. The first OIE standard on animal welfare was published in 2005, and since then, 18 animal welfare chapters have been adopted to address animal welfare of terrestrial animals and farmed fish. The development of new and revised OIE standards follows the OIE standard setting process as briefly described before. The outputs of this work are circulated to members for comments. And indeed, in addition to the scientific excellence, the second principle promoted by the OIE is transparency on its standards development process. All reports from the OIE Specialist Commission and other groups are published on the OIE public website. The OIE delegates are requested to provide comments on these reports. Comments from international organizations having a cooperation agreement with OIE are welcome too, as they often represent a very useful source of information. However, only comments providing scientific knowledge or evidence are taken into consideration and share with the presidents of the commissions. The final outcome of this work belongs to the Assembly of Delegates, as already said, which is sovereign to decide the adoption or not of a new or revised standard. On the subject of particular interest to you, in 2016, Chapter 7.12, dedicated to welfare of working equites, was adopted. This chapter was developed in response to member recognition that in many countries, working equites are used for transport and traction and contribute directly and indirectly to households' livelihoods and benefit communities as a whole. That being recognized, a standard has been set to provide recommendations on the welfare of working uh, equites, and this chapter was revised in 2018 to incorporate new science developments. I previously referred to the network of OIE collaborating centers. With regard to animal welfare, the OIE has four collaborating centers located in the Americas, Europe, and Asia, uh, Asia Pacific regions. They are mainly a consortium of research centers and universities. They provide scientific expertise and support to the OIE and its members, mainly in farm animal, dog population management, and in the use of animals in research and education. And to conclude on animal welfare, let me remind that the OIE uh, Animal Welfare Strategy was adopted in 2017 to provide continuing direction and coordination on the organization's action in this important field. One of the key components is the O-Animal Welfare Forum, which aims to bring together our members and partners to openly discuss relevant animal welfare topics. To date, the Animal Welfare Global Forum has been held in 2019, 20, and 21 to address implementation of animal welfare standards, animal transport, and the relation between animal welfare 
and the UN Sustainable Development Goals, respectively. Another important capacity building activity to support the implementation of OIE standards at the national level was the nomination of national OIE focal point for animal welfare. The OIE organized regular training seminars for them, and I take this opportunity to highlight some important collaborative work between the OIE and the International Coalition for Working Equids, in which World Health Welfare participated in two successful special awareness days were conducted uh, as part of uh, two national focal point seminar, one organized in Lesotho in 2018 and one in Brazil in 2019. To conclude, ladies and gentlemen, as a regulation-oriented body, the OIE has developed an evidence-based approach that is central to the independence, neutrality, and relevance of its outputs. The organization's reputation rest on the timeliness, quality, and objectivity of the scientific evidence used for its own activities. The OIE must and will continue to provide analyses based on the best evidence available to maintain and increase the trust of its members and partners, as well as for its credibility. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish you a fruitful conference. Well. Dr. Monique is a very strong French accent, ladies and gentlemen, and um, it was thank you, thank you to her for giving up her time to, to give us that talk about the importance of evidence in uh, animal health and welfare. Now, somebody, I'm going to introduce you on the stage next, who's very familiar to a lot of you here. It's uh, the dressage rider and trainer, Pammy Hutton, with her view on the role of opinion in equestrianism. Welcome, Pammy. I ask that my introduction was very short because I had brought my cooking clock. I was under instructions not to go one second over 15 minutes. It's uh, uh, your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Pammy Hutton. This is my second job. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Snapchat, and the most notable for issues has been for me on Equestrian's Time to Act, which was formerly FEI Time to Act, which I will talk about a little bit later. I've done a little bit of talking on television and uh, some commentary work uh, when I feel some issues need support. I've heard today about the powerful role of opinion in equestrianism. I think I'm only here because I'm one of those people who make an awful lot of noise on social media, but I, will, I personally have been incredibly lucky in raising monies and issues where I felt that they've needed to be raised. Um, when I say issues, I think firstly and foremostly, if I just had a wish list, it would be to be able to impose bigger penalties for the abuse that is sometimes brought into horses. Because if there was a much bigger deterrent, then we wouldn't be spending so much time trying to fight for the good of the horse. They can't talk. And I repeat, I make a lot of noise. I try to follow facts and evidence. My husband would say not enough. It is very, very hard work and focusing on opinions and whose opinions and the vets, I'm, I will ring up a vet, uh, is really difficult. Now, this is going to be a brand new thing. Hopefully, uh, it is getting the balance right. And I don't profess to get the balance right. In fact, sometimes I do a U-turn, uh, as Boris has this week. Um, there are very many different ways to make a cake, a sponge cake. There are so many different ways to perfect a trot. I used to jump. There are so many different ways to get your jumping a great deal better. I am going to now go very, very fast few, through the issues that I have uh, done. This is fundraising. This was fundraising for us, but I will come to later on the vast amount of money we raised for riding schools in this country and abroad. It was an idea I woke up with. This is to show the ridiculousness of the current law 
uh, on uh, riding schools and how thou shalt not ride in them because you'll catch COVID. This is to show how I actually originally got into this role on social media. It was called Rolka, which is when you put the horse in a rather unnatural position. These are just to show electric spurs. This is another subject that I have covered, heavy people on horses or any sort of cruelty. The overuse of whips, uh, endurance riding, which uh, I know that Pippa Cookson's here and she's best to talk on that. This is how I got into protecting horses, which I will talk about later, drugs, uh, equine, and Tennessee walking horses. I'm still currently doing as much as I possibly can to support in America this abhorrent. Um, human euthanasia, I don't have to touch on it. Luckily, I don't have to mention racing uh, today because that will be talked about later. I now got told I had to take a very big, deep breath. This shows you how ridiculous uh, social media can be. I put up during COVID, very bored. We cook the best breakfast at Talent. A rival establishment said, no, we do industry with Tim Downs and it reached 20,000 people, endless comments, a huge amount of rowing, and I'm not quite sure who won that, so it's about ready for another um, printout. But this just shows you how easy it is to have fun on social media. Now, this was how I got into it. And I'm going to end, uh, I'm going to put my last sentence first. If I had one wish, it would be for every horse that hits the floor as a fatality to be tested for drugs. That's why I, want, I, I would love to form my own committee and simply just get that passed. Because once upon a time, and this is the very short version, I got very alarmed after a comment in my indoor school. He either does a brilliant dressage test and falls over, or he goes double clear and does a dreadful dressage test. I thought to myself, that's a bit odd. Though, yes, we haven't quite got the right amount of dope yet. I logged it. Woke up at 12 o'clock one night, I'd gone to bed early, rang up Ian Woodhead and said to Ian, do you know anything about this latest dope in eventing? And he said, no. He said, I do. It's very dangerous. I said, right, Ian, you know what? We're going to get hold of this. We're going to take it to the FEI, and we're going to get this exposed. So uh, we played detective, took three months to get it. I didn't trust the FEI then. I sent 50% of it. I told them I'd get 50% of it. They don't test it. They caught one world champion. They caught another very big, um, one of the, the important events, beginning with B. And uh, at last, uh, that particular drug disappeared. But it taught me, it taught me how important it could be to expose things. This sat in a lot of um, uh, equine sports and is horrendous. Now, then we get to the short story of COVID. Uh, a Friday happened, and we got telephone, turn all your horses out. I said, I beg your pardon? All of them? Yes, all 95. They've all got to go into the fields. You, thou shalt not ride. It was said much more politely. Um, and to cut that long story short, I was told by a very small riding school the other day that they didn't, they tore up the rule books of all the people who made the rules and followed talent. I'm very proud of that. But you see, to just turn out your top or older competition horses in one big herd would have cost us a million pounds, but it can cost some riding schools with the older horses that have to be in from arthritis. It can cost them their lives. That was where I became aware that our governing bodies, uh, sorry, this little note, do not name them. Uh, our governing bodies might not be getting this totally right. So we didn't. At the moment, there is a law, a law, and luckily I've got a very friendly politician and the Metropolitan Police that will provide some horses to hack to number 10. This is why I make a lot of noise. This law still exists. Thou shalt not teach if we declare it again. This was 
we could not teach in this indoor school. Now we could because we're, uh, we've got government, we're a school, that's the word I'm looking for. But those are the, that we didn't bring the snow in, the snow came in. And that is how ludicrous it is for so many little riding schools up and down the country that were then not able to use their indoor facilities. So, what we did was to start to raise money. And what we actually managed to do, none of our governing bodies, we gave small contributions, I think it was £850 per riding school. Very, very grateful. Thank you, British Shore Society. But we raised £285,000 off Facebook alone for riding schools in this country. And that's where social media can be really helpful for riding schools in this country and in America. And the little riding school that I still remember today that rang me and said, Pammy, we just can't feed our horses on the Monday. What, I can't do the feed bills. So we got hold of a couple of big names and got together a fund for them and got together some raising monies and they paid their feed bill and they're still open today. Now, I'm very lucky, I haven't got a law case around my neck, really. But what happened, and this is the short version on this, and I'm going to run out of time fairly quickly, um, was I was sat uh, watching telly, feet up, quite relaxed, during Europeans. And not this recent one, Olympics or anything like this, during a Europeans. And somebody messaged me and said, have you any idea what's going on in the collecting ring, Pammy? I said, no, I've got my feet up, I'm watching television. Um, I'm sure it was one of the soaps. And they said, well, the abuse to the horses in the collecting ring with the overbending, and it's called Rolka, um, is absolutely horrifying. I said, oh, send it to me. Because in those days, it was unmonitored. Now it's monitored. So this video appeared in front of me, and I was extremely horrified. So I thought, what can I do about this? Oh, come on, Pammy, you're one of the ones who makes a bit of a noise. What you can do is send this video straight to the Europeans onto the judges' table. I had a judge there. I said, please excuse this, but I think you're all, as judges, duty-bound to have this today, tonight. So they left it playing on the table, and the results went from second to about ninth. And then after that came about the laws and the rules and the thou shalt not force your horses into outlines. I had been trying and struggling before, and that, this is a classic example of uh, one of the things, reasons I took the cause on. I couldn't get the, the, the deed done. I did that then. Um, tight nose bands, that's another issue I've fought. Uh, everybody can see that that's far too tight. There are now all sorts of rules, and they're a great deal looser. And uh, I'm going to mention a great friend of mine, uh, William Micklem, who has won welfare awards in the UK and the USA for his Micklem bridle. He's going to kill me because I've got a photograph of it. Um, and this I am going to talk about possibly in a slightly different way. And, but I must tell you, I haven't taken a, f a final personal decision on this. I have heard you say today that they shouldn't have disappeared from horse sports. But until the rules and the regulations are vastly changed, uh, then I disagree. I think that perhaps it should, but this is why my first slide showed the scales. And I can't quite answer it, because is this the beginning of the slippery slope of getting rid of horse sports out of all equestrian games. I really hope not. I, I honestly, I'm monitoring this. As my husband would say, I'm fact seeking. Um, I'm going to put that up now. Of course, I try to do as much research as I have time. I listen to everybody with experience. I've got quite a lot of history behind me, and that stands me in very good stead from my parents and my grandparents. I listen to all experienced horse people, vets and doctors. I try to cope with the Snowflake Brigade, which I've heard mentioned in a slightly more tactful way today, 
the ones that kiss their horses on Monday and stroke them on Tuesday and not sure whether to pick up the horse's feet on Wednesdays. And we must not be dismissive of those because until we get jail sentences, exactly the same things that happen to people, why should animals be treated differently? With the amount of cruelty that is about, until something is tackled at that end, you will have the snowflake brigade that I try very hard to get on, on side. Online bullying, yes, that's happened to me, as you can well imagine. And staying to date is almost impossible. So if you follow the pentathlon story at the moment, you'll see that every day there's a press release on this. It's an ongoing learning experience for me, and I really don't have all the answers. I only know throughout all of this, I am driven by my love of the horse. It's just about to make a noise. <laughs> Pammy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. So many issues there and um, great opinions to improve welfare, etc. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions about that later on. Um, now, I'm aware that time is getting on, so now it's time to introduce our final speaker in this session remotely. Um, we're going to introduce Ed Chamberlain, who's the lead uh, presenter on ITV Racing, to talk about his view of the role of opinion in the media. Well, hi everyone, it is Ed Chamberlain here from ITV Racing. I hope the conference is going well. I'm very sorry I'm not part of it live today, not there as well. I'm afraid the lure of the Breeders' Cup at Del Mar and a bit of time in California afterwards was too appealing. I will be back though for the November meeting at Cheltenham, which I'm looking forward to enormously. Well, what a challenge I was set today by Sheila. To answer the question as the presenter of horse racing on ITV and terrestrial television, whose opinion matters? That is the million dollar question really in my trade. You could argue that the person whose opinion matters is my boss, because as long as my boss enjoys what I'm doing, then all is tickety-boo. The truth is though, it's a lot more than that, having this job. A lot of people's opinion matters. You could argue that everyone who watches ITV, their opinion matters. That's the way I believe. But I'm also fully aware that television is subjective. For example, one boss might like the way I do it or like the way ITV do it, another might not. One viewer might like it, another might not. Uh, everyone has an opinion on it, everyone's opinion does matter, but I'm also aware that it is subjective and not everyone is going to like the way I do it, not everyone is going to like the way ITV Racing does it. But whose opinion really matters? That's something I'm going to tackle and try and make you understand my ethos with that. And the truth is, I listen to as many people's opinions as possible. I am a great believer that everyone who watches their opinion matters. We have a very, very important thing to take into account, and that is, and this is the thing I teach in media training, the same thing applies if you're presenting a sport on terrestrial television, if you're presenting to a class, if you're making a presentation to an office, a conference like today, if you're just making a presentation to a couple of people. The key thing is, and if you remember one thing from today, it will probably be this, know your audience, or at least know your audience as best you can. That is the key. The first thing I think of, if I'm hosting an awards is right, what's my audience? I wanna know everything about that audience. Who's got a birthday? Who's from where? All these little bits and pieces to try and engage with that audience, have that warmth and likability that I think is such an important part of any presenter. But knowing your audience is key because you've got to pitch it right. So my audience on an ITV four day midweek at somewhere like Newmarket is a very different audience, for example, to the weekend on a Saturday afternoon, where it's a much bigger audience on a Saturday. It's full of people who work really hard during the week and just want to relax and be entertained, have a good time, enjoy the racing, maybe have a bet. That's a very different audience to a more specialized midweek audience. And likewise, a different audience on Derby Day when you've got nearly three million people watching. Gold Cup Day, likewise, a huge, aud audience, huge audience on terrestrial television, building to an audience of nearly 10 million people watching the Randox Grand National on ITV and hundreds of millions worldwide. So knowing your audience helps you to try and pitch it right. Whose opinion you listen to within that is very difficult because everyone has an opinion. When I first started a big job presenting on television was 2010, I suppose, when I presented Premier League football, the Super Sunday and Monday night football shows on Sky. And in those days, it was really 
largely before social media got going. So the only opinion you'd really hear was via the newspapers and individuals, very, very different now, which brings me on to the second part of our audience, really, when you talk about the television audience, and that is social media. How do you deal with social media? Who do you listen to on social media? That again is, a, is, is an important question uh, to tackle this afternoon. But let's, first let's talk about the television audience and whose opinion matters from that audience. So I estimate that there's probably around 80,000 real horse racing aficionados in this country, people who buy the Racing Post or subscribe to Racing TV. That's the type of person I'm talking about. And we wouldn't get all of them watching ITV on a Saturday afternoon. Of course we wouldn't. But we would get a total audience of sometimes around eight, 900,000, sometimes a million people. So if you think about it on a conveyor belt, like the sort of generation game conveyor belt, if you like, at this end, of an escalator even, going up and down, are the real racing aficionados, the people who eat, live and breathe racing and will watch it come what may, all the way through people who, who dip in and out of racing, all the way through to the other end of the spectrum, which are people who maybe dip in and out of racing to the extent they only watch it once, to, once or twice a year. You have got to try, as the presenter on terrestrial television, to keep all those people, all those people along the conveyor belt with different interests in racing, one hooked and two entertained. That's the challenge because their opinions matter and you've got to try and keep them engaged with ITV racing. That's the challenge we've had. It's an impossible task. We can't keep everyone happy, but the way we try and do it is to have something for everyone on the show because, as I say, everyone's opinion matters. The opinions of those aficionados matters. Hence, we deal with everything, sectional timings, all the real finer detail of racing. We'll have something on the show for them all the way through to the light entertainment side because at the end of the day, we're presenting horse racing on an entertainment channel in ITV, which is why we do things like The Social Stable, engaging youngsters on Instagram. Chris Hughes is a huge part of what we do. Charlotte Hawkins, Mark Hayes with the fashion uh, to appease the sponsors and so on. Hopefully on an ITV show, there is something for everyone, which really sums up the fact that everyone's opinion does matter. So something for everyone is the goal. It's a very, very difficult thing to achieve. Within that, we've also got to tackle other things. And I know you'll have been talking about horse welfare in the conference, and it's so, so important. It's probably the biggest challenge of the lot at the moment, and, and you can't hide from it. We're fighting a very difficult PR battle at the moment in the sport. When you think of the Cheltenham Festival with COVID, you've had the Gordon Elliott incident, we've had Panorama, all sorts of ongoing issues. It is a difficult, difficult PR battle. But we believe particularly when it comes to horse welfare, that we need to be on the front foot. We need to be proactive rather than reactive, which is why from the start, when we first started on the 1st of January 2017, we tried to explain things. We had jargon busters. We had a vet on the show. And then, of course, four weeks into our tenure, we had the tragic Many Clouds incident at Cheltenham, which was so important. Before that, we'd been on the front foot. We were able to say, this is what we explained last week. This is why this happens. Education, information is everything. And we'll always be proactive with horse welfare because horse welfare genuinely in this country is fabulous. Yes, we can improve in certain areas. Of course we can. And we need to educate the audience about that, how well horses are cared for in this country before they go into training, while they're in training, and of course, the aftercare as well. It's something that we really need to be on the front foot with and proactive with because that is a big thing for our audience right now. OK, on to the social media aspect, which, again, I th imagine is something you're covering a lot today. Not something I had to worry about too much when I first started presenting. It became a big thing when I first started doing a show called Monday Night Football with a guy called Gary Neville, who played for England and Manchester United. A few of you might have heard of him. And just to, to give you an example of how to deal with social media, everyone will do it differently. This is just the way I do it. Again, it's subjective. We trended globally after the first Monday Night Football I ever did. It was Manchester City against Swansea, and we trended for all the wrong reasons. Monday Night Football was a huge show, an iconic show. It was our first stab at it. And we took a lot of stick that day. And I learned a lot that day about social media, in particular Twitter. We took a lot of stick. And lessons I learned took me through to the 1st of January 2017, the first show we did at Cheltenham on ITV after, what, 30 or something years of... Uh, well, the first show, it would have been on ITV for over 30 years. And you can imagine the stick we took. The show didn't go to plan. We presented it in a monsoon. I was given quite a lot of stick. I remember on the high street, people shouting at me. I was rubbish. I was described by Giles Smith in the Times as about as exciting as a chest of drawers from Ikea, self-assembly one. 
My dad said it was a bit harsh on the self-assembly chest of drawers from Ikea, but there we go. But I got a text from Gary Neville, who reminded me of what we'd been through with Monday Night Football, and I think he summed it up rather well, and the way to deal with social media now. He said, just remember, Ed, things are never as bad as you think they are, but also at times they're never as good as you think they are either. That's the real Sir Alex Ferguson ethos from their time at Manchester United. And he's right, on social media these days, you're either the hero or you're the villain. There's not a whole lot in between. People with common sense, and common sense is one of the most important things in any walk of life, and certainly in television. The common sense seems to get drowned out by the hyperbole and the outrage Olympics, I suppose, you get on social media these days. And another example of that, that day one was an example of that. It wasn't that bad. And of course, it was our first go and we were going to improve from it. And, and we stuck together and hopefully uh, did that. Most recently on Champions Day, I interviewed Sheikh Farhad uh, about the champion jockey, Asheen Murphy. To me, it was a, a pretty standard interview. And yet on social media, I was described as everything from one end of the spectrum as disgraceful and disrespectful to others who said, what a brilliant interview. If I'm honest, I think it was somewhere in between. To me, it was a very basic, straightforward uh, interview where journalistically I needed to ask a couple of questions, no more than that. But on social media, that outrage Olympics is something you just have to take with a pinch of salt these days. How do I deal with social media? In truth, I don't listen to a lot of it. You need good filters on it to know what to listen to and what not to listen to. You need good people around you because you do need thick skin at times. But in truth, the, the, the truth sometimes is somewhere in the middle. There's a lot of good things. You do need to be on social media. I've no doubt about that. Brilliant information source, brilliant way of reading opinions. And you've just got to learn whose opinion matters on social media. And my lesson again from media training I'm afraid if you broadcast to social media, and in particular, if you broadcast to Twitter, it's time to turn out the lights because that is not the way to do it. The outrage and things you have to read on there. No, no. By all means, read it, listen to it, take some things on board. Yes, but don't broadcast to social media. That is a, an easy pitfall to fall into. And how do you deal with it? Important of experience, those filters, and just have really good people around you. It, it's so polarised at the moment, it's one end of the spectrum to the other, and the truth usually is somewhere uh, in between. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of the challenge you face presenting a horse racing on terrestrial television. To me, I think, whose opinion matters then? Who, what is the, the deduction you'd make from everything I've learned? I like to think that everyone's opinion matters. I think our audience is so important to try and please as many people as we can. You've just got to read everything, listen to everything, but just have really good filters. Be able to handle the good and the bad and have good people around you and have good advice and good discussion about the way forward. And on terrestrial television, you're speaking to a very, very large audience. You're never gonna please everybody, that is impossible. But you try and get the best balance you can and try and please as many people as you possibly can, because simply everyone opinion, everyone's opinion does matter. You just can't please everybody. I hope that makes sense. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to some of what I've had to say, because at the end of the day, it, this is a job I absolutely love, a challenge I absolutely relish in the most wonderful industry. So lucky to work in horse racing and anyone listening who works in horse racing, I'm sure feels the same way. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ed, and i um, sorry you couldn't be here in person, but you understand the reasons why. Now, I'm well aware of the time, and uh, of course, we're all well aware of the importance of the day as well. It's the 11th of the 11th, and it's just gone 11 o'clock. We are going to observe uh, the two-minute silence here at the Royal Geographical Society, uh, thinking of those both human and equine who lost their lives uh, during the wars. So if you'd like to, uh, to stand, or if you can, or stay seated, we'll observe a two minute silence.
Our sincere thanks to the Household Cavalry Trumpeters for joining us here this morning. Um, continuing the event then, we're going to get some uh, questions and answers on our three presentations this morning. Two of them are remotely, of course, from Dr. Elwa and Ed Chamberlain, who obviously can't be here today. We do have Pammy here, of course, who's going to join us on the stage. And uh, in place of Ed, uh, welcome uh, Nick Powell, Sky Sports editor, the next best thing. I was so delighted to see Nick here. <laughs> I know, he, he, Nick is a pro former member of this uh, team actually up here at the Royal Geographical. It's great to see you here, Nick. And also welcome Leopoldo Suado Escobar. Um, Leopoldo, you're most welcome uh, here, who's joining us uh, virtually from Paris on, uh, from the World Organization for Animal Health. So I'm hoping, there he is. Uh, hello, hello Leopoldo, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for the invitation. Very nice to see you, and thank you very much for joining us. I shall sit down in the middle. Um, <laughs> we've got some questions for all of you. Now, let's see if I can get this thing to work, which would be amazing if I do. Um, I think, Nick, we'll start with you. We haven't heard from you net yet, Nick, because um, that was an interesting piece from Ed. Um, he says he doesn't pay much attention to social media. I suspect that may be half the truth, because it is, it is out there, and it's always ever-present, is it, though? Yeah. Um, I'm quite wary of what I post on social media. I'm different from some of my colleagues in that. I think it is, as Ed said, it's an essential tool to all those of us who work in, in the media, as he said, not just as a, a way of finding information quickly, which you then have to check every time, and we in what I call the mainstream media, believe me, do check really thoroughly and really carefully. I know there's a, a widespread assumption, I fear, uh, and some of you may feel this way, that we just shove stuff on the screen instantly and check later. Uh, we don't. Um, my boss at Sky News, John Riley, has a favorite saying, which is uh, being first is cool, being first and wrong is not cool. Uh, and we, we try to observe that pretty, pretty carefully. I'll give you an example, Mike, of how social media tends to react and how irritating it is. When Emma Raducanu won the US Open, I was asked to write an article for the Sky News website looking ahead to what might lie ahead for her in the future. And I made the point that it was not a given that she would have a fantastically successful career lasting many years. And I pointed out that some other teenagers in recent years have won Grand Slam tournaments and haven't won another one. But I also paid tribute to all the wonderful things that she'd done, and I said that with the right help she could have a fantastic career, but it's not a given. Uh, and most reaction I got was positive, but there were some people who uh, posts on social media along the lines of um, you can't wait, can you, in the media, you at Sky, to knock someone it's 24 hours since she won this tournament. All you want to do uh, is put her down. It's the last thing we were trying to do. We were just trying to give some perspective, but you can't, you can never please everyone all the time, and you can't really try to. Nick, thanks for that. That's a, it's a tricky, tricky thing, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, yeah. May, I don't read Twitter before bed. It's, seriously, I don't. Yeah. If I, I, I read Twitter first thing in the morning, <laughs> I don't read it before bed. A lot Not as daft as I look. <laughs> That's why you're a Sky Sports uh, editor, Nick. Um, there's a question here. I want to put this one to, to Leopoldo there in, in Paris. Um, regarding the OIE, um, what is the consensus of opinion on how we as welfare organisations, Leopoldo, deal with the public with incorrect opinions on social media. How do we deal with that? Uh, okay, thanks, thanks for the question. I, I hope that you hear me well. I don't know if there's too much echo. No, it's fine. We can hear you well. Perfect. I, I, I think that uh, the, the OIE tried to, to solve that problem with the uh, well-established standard processing uh, uh, process that uh, we conduct. As uh, Dr. Eloi mentioned, there is a full consultation period, and in a way, we also we expect that our uh, member countries duplicate that process in their own countries. 
therefore as much as discussion uh, we had uh, on the science-based uh, text that uh, we developed, we can ensure that those uh, influences from, for example, social media or uh, and inform uh, people that try to interfere with the with this uh, uh, science-based process uh, have less uh, importance in the final uh, opinion that uh, members have at the moment of adoption, uh, adoption because you have to take in mind that even the OIE uh, developed the, the text in, in, in this process, uh, uh, taking into account the best science possible. At the end, our member countries at the general session that adopt uh, the uh, standards and their other considerations are part of the decision uh, from, from members. Therefore, in, in summary, I think the, the, the OIE through the uh, standard setting process and, and the, the uh, communication and also the discussion in the several uh, uh, parts of the process can help to avoid these uh, influences that are um, uh, uh, affecting the, the uh, understanding of uh, the, the, the topic. But it's true that it is something challenging and more and more, as uh, Dr. Lua mentioned today, with uh, um, uh, this, uh, all the importance that social media has in, in the environment. Over. Thank, thanks, Leopoldo. Um, Pammy, one for you here, re-changing opinions. How do we beat the social media algorithms, which often disregard evidence, as we know, whilst reinforcing entrenched views? How do we talk to groups with very disparate views? Do we start in schools, perhaps? Well, you've answered it. Uh, yes, <laughs> and schools, they're almost uh, better informed than we are. There will be some people in this audience who aren't on any social media. And I think you ignore social media at your peril. Now, I have had a very lucky reign. I have a private site, I have a riding school site, I have a dressage site, and I have an action site for welfare issues. And I am almost never attacked. If the subject is attacked by perhaps you should not ride ever, which does come up, I never jump on it straight away because there's going to be about another 400 people that will jump on it, of which 200 will say you're quite right, we must never ride again, and the other 200 will say you're all being absolutely ridiculous. All I do is try to monitor the tone of the thing. And I find that if you're polite and you, 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 you are just and you are fair and you listen, you can influence social media into, it's been a huge tool for me. I was thinking when I sat down, people are going to wonder why I resorted to social media. Well, it used to be newspapers and or television, uh, and we were very lucky to have Sky in our indoor school uh, helping to explain how ridiculous it was that one couldn't ride in indoor riding schools. And then as social media developed, uh, I'm very, I just had a, a golden social media, I'll probably after today, be attacked right, left and centre. <laughs> but I've had a very good time and I think you have to listen and then ignore the abuse, verbal. That's all I do mm. and that's all I preach. You mentioned the modern pentathlon up there. I um, did. Yeah. Uh, somebody's asked here, how do we, um, what's the difference between the modern pentathlon and um, uh, between these athletes riding a horse in competition uh, as, as to the BHS exams? Oh, good heavens. That's a good one. Yeah, um, good question. I mean, first of all, the riding in the pentathlons was such an important part of the pentathlon that the athletes learnt to ride and, uh, to a much greater depth than they do now. Uh, and I have to say that it is slightly much more, you know, well, we get on the horse and we just kick it round and hopefully the horses are going to be good enough to do what it is that we want them to do. When they, uh, and I am a little blunt, can't ride. Some of the athletes haven't bothered to ride. Now, I would say they should at least be up to stage four uh, or even uh, a little bit higher. They should be able to jump one metre, 20 or 30 at home and then the whole thing, if it's brought back in, uh, at another Olympic Games needs to be lowered 
and there's been a huge row, should style matter? Oh, you can't have style mattering. Well, I think style matters when you do dressage. So I can't actually see, since dressage is an enormous sport worldwide, why style couldn't matter. And if the athletes had learnt to ride, despite the horses perhaps not being the most generous, uh, I don't believe the issue would have happened. And it's been ongoing for years. Uh, Olympics after Olympics, somebody told me, seven Olympics. And so it was going to go this time. I only hope it's brought back in with revised ground rules. Yeah, well, these are changing times, aren't they? Things are changing yeah. all the time. A uh, question for you, Leopoldo, re re concerning the OIE. How does the OIE match the opinions of scientific experts with the opinions of the animal owners globally? Surely there must be a conflict at times? Yeah, sure, and, uh, and we, uh, we see that in, 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 uh, in our process. Uh, Dr. Ulloa mentioned the last chapter that was proposed for adoption, uh, laying hands, and there we, we really perceive the, the different opinion between regions, between stakeholders, and, and as I said, the, the, the ones that adopt the standards are member countries. Then uh, <clears throat> the, the different uh, stakeholders and, and, and partners, uh, as uh, for example, um, the uh, International Coalition for Working Equids through the International Coalition for uh, uh, Animal Welfare can participate in, in, the, in the process and also can do it the uh, producers' organizations uh, for, uh, in, in, in other uh, chapters or the, uh, the academia. Then that is a way that we can collect as much as possible opinions and information from, from different uh, 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 stakeholders and, and, and well, realities. I saw in, in, in the, the question and answer chat that, that it was how we captured the, the regional also uh, aspect uh, with the, the different uh, uh, cultural or, or even sometimes religion opinion. That is a way that we can collect, collect information to uh, improve the text because the idea is to achieve a consensus about the text because if we don't achieve that consensus, the, the chapters or the standards that we adopted and we're going to be hardly uh, implement in the field. Because as also Dr. Ulla mentioned, we don't have the, the power to enforce those chapters in the field in, in, in each member country, and it's the veterinary service to do it. Then if the uh, people that are adopted th those chapters are not convinced of uh, them, uh, it's going to be more difficult to, to implement. Thanks. Thank you, Leopoldo. Um, Nick, back to you. Um, does the horse world need to recognise that public attitudes towards animals is changing, e.g. the use of the whip in, in horse racing? Uh, and experts need to respect and acknowledge that what was once considered a norm uh, or acceptable is no longer so. Do you think that in well, this changing world? Yeah, yeah. everything changing, the world changes, you have to, you have to adapt. Um, but it comes back to whose opinion matters and as, as Ed said everyone's opinion matters up to a point um, and you, 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 you apply different weights to, to different opinions. Um, to, to take a, a trivial example from the world of TV that I work in, the old-fashioned vox pop on a, on a popular topic, you might, you might do it, you might, it's been done on, on use of the whip in mm. horse racing. Go into a street in Barnsley, we always, when I worked at Yorkshire Television in Leeds, we always went to Barnsley, you get the, you get the most trenchant opinions in, in Barnsley, uh, and go out and ask people what do they think about the use of, 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 of the whip in horse racing. Now, is that relevant? Is it fair to say, what a waste of television time, what do their opinions matter? As a scientific exercise, it doesn't exist, it's not a scientific exercise. It's partly a means of entertainment. And Ed made the point that you have to, if you're broadcasting at all, you have to try and be relatable to and entertaining up to a point. That's what we try and do on this, this platform, otherwise no one's going to, going to listen. Um, you have to do everything that you can to, to make it clear, engage the audience. So if there's if it does no more than make people think about it, and it might be that it does no more than make people think about it, it's still a valuable exercise. Yes, yes. Um, a couple more points before we, we, we bring this to, to a close. There's, there's questions coming in 
all over the place here, and it's fascinating. Um, do you think we engage enough with young people, Leopoldo, that to, to seek their opinions, and perhaps inform them with, with scientific evidence? What's your view about that at the OIE? Well, in, in fact, yes, uh, we do a, an important work with the veterinary students. The OI have a collaborating uh, agreement with the International Veterinary Student Association. And we, uh, since uh, two years, we don't have, we couldn't have do it. Uh, we we uh, provide an, uh, the, the opportunity for a young student to visit the, the OIE and also the OIE have an important work on the uh, pr provide uh, uh, guidance on the veterinary curriculum to include the aspect, for example, welfare aspects in the curriculum. Then we are we are doing an important work with the uh, with the veterinary students uh, around the world. Uh, and, and imagine also talking about uh, uh, social media. The DOI has invested a lot in being more more present in, in in the more important social media. Try to sometimes counterbalance this lack of a, a, a reliable information. Over. Leopoldo, and and just to end on this one, which is just up your street here, Pammy. Are you sure? Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> At the start of the conference, Nigel Payne stated that the horse must come first. What steps should the industry be taking to better capture the opinion of our horses, whether in sport, leisure, or therapeutic roles? I mean, where do you want to start on that? In how many minutes? <laughs> um, and just hearing just the odd word of laughter brings me back to your previous question for the young, and I know you've tried to steer it for the young, if sometimes it's not kept slightly light-hearted and with a sense of humour, the young switch off. And it has to be so fast when you want to get your information out there. But to answer your question uh, briefly, uh, the love of the horse is some, something I wanted and I still haven't actually written the, yet the book I want to write about. But in the old days, we came off farms and we rode and everybody rode and they rode the cows in and they just shooed them and they, they had a good, better understanding of animals. Nowadays, the upbringing and those who actually become really successful Olympians will sometimes come from an inner city or, and to get the knowledge out on what ears mean, what the nose means, what the, the coat means, what a horse just stood in a stable, whether it's happy or it isn't happy. And we saw the photographs on the war and I, I, I've never, there was not one horse there that didn't look utterly dejected. Now you hope you don't see any horse in sport, other than perhaps the one slide we have seen today, looking utterly dejected. But there's not enough teaching at the base level of a horse. You have a large number of puppies, how to train the dog, how to lead it. We still need better programming on the horse, the horse's instincts, the communication. I used to teach my horses to lie down. I didn't push them anywhere, you know. And, and uh, it's just that communication with an animal needs vastly improving as well and alongside all the science. I don't know whether I got that. No, I? I, think, I think you do. <laughs> um, and Nick, finally, I just wanted to ask you, generally speaking, when you're broadcasting, I mean, you, you've got years of experience now as one of the best and, the, and, and being Sky Sports editor. When you're actually looking at the camera, what sort of age group do you think you're addressing? What's your sort of default? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Ed, Ed touched on it. Um, and uh, sadly, the, the average age according to all the science we have of the, our audience on mainstream TV is, is getting older. It's, 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 it's people like you and me, Mike. Um, uh, um, uh, Gray-haired, um, wizened veterans. Um, and it, it, it's really important, and you, you try really hard, um, not consciously minute by minute. If you say, who, who am I addressing? I'm, I'm addressing, you think of, of of one person, you try to try to try to talk to people. 
Yeah. Um, but you try really hard to make it clear, make it relatable, make it entertaining. One of the best, one of the best bits of feedback, the, the bit I liked best, the complimentary feedback, I don't know, I'll ignore the rest of it, uh, came from um, an American broadcaster who works for F Fox News, I think, his name's Greg Palcott. Uh, he's the Europe-based correspondent, I think, for Fox. Might be CBS. Um, because it's America, their Europe correspondent covers Baghdad as well, so he, 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 I've seen him being wearing flak jackets, being shot at in Baghdad. <laughs> but he, he used to chat to me in the coffee queue, because they, they were based at Sky, and he would talk to me about American sport, and I'd do my best to keep up. But he, he said to me, my wife loves you. I can't do it. I went to the accent. My wife loves you. <laughs> she, she doesn't like sport. Doesn't like sport at all. But she said, "I love that guy. He always looks like he's come from a great party." And okay, it's 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 trivial. But if the if the audience are are with you, if they're following you, that's a start. Um, because it, to take a, the Sky News example, you're doing maybe a three-minute bulletin, maybe a two-minute bulletin. And some of the audience won't care about sport, would rather you weren't there. Some of my colleagues would rather I wasn't there. Um, they might want to make a cup of tea. So you have to make sure that it's clear. And if, I'm, if I dare make a point, I think a lot of us in the hall, I'm going to be brave enough to say it, the presentation from Monique might have been better with subtitles. Because listening with all the, um, listening on a video, it was quite hard to, to take in. It's got to be clear. People have got to want to listen to you. There's no point in being brilliant if the audience you're talking to doesn't understand or has gone off to make a cover to you, you've got to keep them with you. Um, and if you, you've got to remember who Sky News Sports Bulletin is very different from working for Sky Sports News. You have to explain what's going on. It's no good talking about the PGA Tour in golf because the, it's the American Tour. But the, that means nothing mm. to most of your Sky News viewers. You've got to all the time think about what language you're using. Is this making sense to the people I want to, to listen to this? Or are they going to go and make a cup of tea? Because if they're doing that, you may as well just shut up. <laughs> well said. Uh, Nick Powell, Sky Sports uh, editor, thank you so much. Pammy, thank you to you. And Leopoldo Stuardo Escobar over there in Paris. Thank you so much, Leopoldo, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hold on, mate. Thanks, Pammy. Now, um, we're almost up to uh, time for a break, actually. Now, this is where I should have introduced the film at this stage, not earlier on. That was completely my, my, my bad, as they say these days. Um, yeah, this is a little highlight of a short film to highlight. We're going to miss a film? OK, we'll miss a film. It was never going to be shown anyway, was it? <laughs> so, Roly, what time would you like us back here, sir? 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock? We'll reconvene in your seats by midday, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your coffee break wherever you are in the world. We'll see you again in about half an hour's time. Thank you. Join us both <laughs> online and in the Education Centre at the RGS during the break for our Charity in Action films, where we will explore the important role of working horses, donkeys and mules in women's lives in Colombia. In certain parts of Colombia, there are projects run by the government where working equity will be replaced by motorized vehicles. We wanted to find out from the women what they thought of that. We will also show how incorporating the opinions of the vet, farrier, physio, groom and dentist in devising the care plan for a horse at our centres is so vital. There's not just one opinion that matters. It takes a whole team of opinions to help in the rehabilitation of the horse. Our final presentation features an MP speaking about how members of the public can best influence their government to improve animal welfare. So join us online and in the Education Centre during the break for these short presentations. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Whose opinion matters when we're actually thinking about rehabilitation of horses? We at the farms use what we call the whole horse method. 
Now, this has evolved over the years because we found it necessary to bring in as many opinions as we could. Now, we really break this down into four sections. Our vets, our farriers, our physios, and most importantly, our rehab grooms. They're really not in all any particular order. Every horse is seen by a vet in the first instance. We hopefully have had a history as best as we can for the horse come, before it comes into our care. Now, if only we had a crystal ball to see what has gone on before. And this is where it can get very interesting. From this slide, you will see that a lot of crossovers from each profession that comes into it. So whose opinion actually matters here? The answer to that is everybody's opinion of our team matters for the horse. We rely on each other. We rely on each other's opinion and also instruction and what's best for each horse. Our opinions collectively is always very useful that, uh, because we are able to communicate we're able to uh, chat and talk and discuss our opinions. And we, will, we might not all agree at the first time, but however, talking about it and then planning ahead is always very, very useful for each case. Of course, there's one opinion that I haven't mentioned, and that is the opinion of the horse itself. Observation, communication, from the horse can help tremendously in its rehab. If it's not happy, why? What is happening? If only we had that crystal ball, he would have been able to tell us. Or maybe one day he will be able to talk to us. I will now go on into a case that we received earlier this year, six months ago. Now this horse came via a lady that had bought off the internet looking for her new best friend and a new beginning for herself and hopefully for the horse himself. However, it came with the title six-year-old schoolmaster. Now in my opinion, six-year-old schoolmaster, it doesn't really go. A six-year-old is not actually fully adult yet. That will come when he's seven, or if he's larger, maybe eight. So to say he's an actual schoolmaster, I do question that. But then that's my opinion. The last thing you expect to come off the lorry is a horse looking like this. Would you expect it to look like this, in your opinion? I would very much doubt it. This horse was received into Bellwade at the end of March. On our initial assessment, it was quite obvious to most of us. He was underweight, he had perfect care, skin issues, forelimb, tissue queries, poor muscular skeletal conformation, in fact, no muscle at all, or very, very little. Now, in my opinion, one of the key things that I find interesting is why was this wind sucking? Now, if I always remember being told if a horse can learn a bad habit, why can't it learn a good habit? So, in my opinion, is this a vice, is that a bad habit, or is this horse actually trying to tell us something? This is going to be key, I think. So, throwing that into the pot, uh, the plan of rehabilitation, went forth. We take blood tests, fecal egg counts for the worming infestation. We have dental assessments, resolve skin issues. Uh, we feed according to the weight it is, rather than the weight that we want. We utilize Dr. Green. If you're not familiar with that term, Dr. Green, high fiber, it's green, it's called grass. Let the horse become a horse again, if it has actually been in a herd or it might have been a long time since. Observe what that horse is doing in its natural state. Get its mental well-being 
hopefully in the best form. With when you feel or the horse feels better, then within himself, you might just see a difference very quickly. As we continue, we then have the program that the team decides is the best way forward. We're always reassessing that program because we never know what the horse is going to throw at us. Is he going to turn out to be lame? We just haven't seen it. We just put it down to a poor muscle. Or has he got an underlying condition? Is there something else? This is actually what makes rehabilitation really quite interesting. If only they could talk, it would make our life a lot simpler. However, six months later, and lots of rehabilitation, back to basics, lunging, groundwork, long reining, being allowed to be a horse, being able to interact with a herd of other horses, seeing how he is in his pecking order. It's always very useful to see how he is progressing. I am not saying that this new horse has finished his rehabilitation. He's got a little bit to go yet. But from the photograph, and it is the same horse, I believe me, his ears are pricked forward, his coat and his muscles are looking so much better. I think his opinion is he's a lot happier. We're never too sure what is going to get thrown at us. Observation, communication is key to all this. But our philosophy really is back to basics. Find out what the horse is, what is going on and how can we help. It can take several months. It can take quite um, a lot of work to go in and an awful lot of understanding. But as our team at, at each, each centre, we find that being able to talk to each other and, and unraveling all the opinions that we have is really the best way forward for each case. We might not always agree, but it's always good to talk. And also the horse opinion might actually be able to help us too. As you can see from our programme and the results after six months, it takes a whole team of opinions, not just one. But if you have more opinions and good opinions from the experts who have the experience and have the open-mindedness to see a way forward for each horse and pony that come into our care and maybe ones at your own home, then it can only be a good ending. And that's like happy horse going out on our rehoming scheme. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Debbie and today my colleague Carolina from Fundacion Arrieros in Colombia and I will be talking about the importance of considering women's opinions when related to equine welfare. Around the world culturally, men do the manual labor, receive income, and are often considered as the owners of equids, whilst women play a much less visible role. Often, when we conduct training or workshops in communities with equid owners, we find that there are very few women present. In many cultures, women are not actively encouraged to speak out and therefore do not feel comfortable expressing themselves. Today, we want to demonstrate to you through three separate investigations from different parts of the world, the importance of involving women and especially listening to their opinions when planning and carrying out community-led programs. My name is Carolina and I'm the project coordinator at Fundación Arrieros Colombia, which partners with War Horse Welfare. Today, I will be talking about the importance of considering the opinion of women. So here is a map of Colombia. It's a country in South America with 32 departments and has a great variety of climate, production, flora and fauna. And there are 1.5 million working equids in the country. This year, Arrieros, the University of Nottingham, says University, 
in Colombia and World Health Welfare carry out research reducing the financial vulnerability to the socioeconomic effects of COVID-19 in working equity owners in Colombia. During the investigation, we had the opportunity to visit nine communities where, as you can see from the screen, working equities contribute in different ways. Some carry water, milk, sugarcane or panela, and other work in terms, personal transport, or transporting construction materials. During this investigation, we carry out some focus group activities. We did separate groups for women, some were equity owners and some were not. Then there was another group for male equity owners and the leaders of the communities. From the video and these photos, you can see how these focus groups were conducted. The focus groups lasted up to 40 minutes where some general questions from the community were asked and then more specific questions related to equities where we got some very interesting and valuable opinion from the women. It should be noted that the presence of women in Colombia in the workplace began after the violence that our country has suffered started. Families were left without the male of the household so they, to be able to survive economically. The females had to strengthen, they had to perform the jobs that their previous husbands did. And this meant that the alliance between equities and working women began. Some quotes from the focus groups what do you think are the problems facing equines in this town? We need to raise awareness of the mutual benefit that we get from horses. We depend on them for so many things, so they need to have great welfare and health. Then the horses are happier and they will be able to work better. A healthy animal will generate profits as it will be more productive. There are some very remote places here where owners have no access to vet services in case of an emergency. I think we should train and educate horse owners on how to manage health problems. When asked about a vehicle replacement scheme, in certain parts of Colombia, there are projects run by the government where working equity will be replaced by motorized vehicles. We wanted to find out from the women what they thought of that. What will happen if we remove all the working equities in town of Andes? How will you feel? Oh no, how sad that would be. Not just that, but if we didn't have equities here, people would starve. It would be awful for Andes because the people rely on their equities for so many things. They are used to transport food and coffee. And by doing that, they provide economical support for the household. When we ask about what assistance could be given, are people here in Santa Marta open to having some training? It would be nice for all of us to receive more training. This is what we most need right now. Then we can learn how to treat our equids better. Not everyone has the patience or the love to treat an animal in the way that it deserves. So creating an awareness on how an animal should be treated is fundamental so everyone can understand that they feel pain, just as humans do. So please don't forget us here in Santa Marta and come back with more training. Through this research, we have been able to conclude some interesting findings. Many women consider education and training as a necessity for equity owners. In regions of Colombia, where there is a history of violence, women have taken over roles traditionally held by men, many of them now working with their equities for economic stability. Understanding the role of women and working equity is vital when considering the five sustainable development goals about gender equality. We will continue to work on this project and look forward to sharing more with you in the future.
In Zimbabwe, a hay distribution study was carried out. And one of the themes found was that the female household members were greatly helped by donkeys as they reduced the labor that women would have to carry out. For example, donkeys helped to perform arduous tasks such as transporting water, firewood and other goods, and are also used for providing transport for income generating activities. The hay distribution initiative really benefited the women. Providing hay regularly meant the donkeys were less likely to stray in search of scarce gra grazing and thus were easier to catch when needed. This freed up more time for women to use on other activities and the reduced cost spent on feeding the donkeys also saved income for other household expenses. Now, onto some research conducted in Guatemala by an undergraduate bursary student. The aim of this study was to investigate how working equids contributes to women livelihood in six of the World Health Welfare Program target communities in Guatemala and determine what roles women have in their care. 34 face-to-face -face interviews were carried out and data was analyzed using both quantitative and qualitative methods. Finding from the study showed that chores such as collecting firewood and water which without an equid would pass on to the women in the family. 32 women said that they were the primary caregivers for all livestock, including equids, although only five women were actively involved with using the equids and 18 women saying that they were fearful of equids. Decision making was found to be done by the equid owners or the men. 31 out of 34 women said that they would attend training opportunities, but barriers would need to be addressed, such as raising awareness for when events were happening and childcare considerations. So from these three studies, we can see that the role of women and work in equids is misunderstood. The studies highlight the benefits work in equids provide to women, and furthermore, it is evident that women provide significant contributions to the husbandry of working equids. The inclusion of women in policy and extension services, coupled with education and training, would both empower women and would impact working equids welfare. So even though women play a less visible role with equids, really the role that they do play with them is crucial and because of this, having women's voices heard is absolutely vital. Your Royal Highness, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for giving me the opportunity today to talk a little on the subject of whose opinion matters and how can you as individuals, as opinion formers, as organisations, make sure that your voice is heard by those who will be in a, in a position to make decisions, to bring about legislative change, to influence government. As a member of parliament for 11 years now, and a former minister and a current select committee chair, it's really obvious to me that there are a number of avenues that people can use, and some are more effective than others. I would always advise organisations to look out for government consultations on a wide range of issues. Sometimes that is very much putting the onus upon you as opposed to the onus upon government to make sure that you're aware of what is currently being consulted on. I know firsthand that government consultations can sometimes get lost in a myriad of other press releases, of time pressures, of issues that you're all dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But actually consultation responses really matter. They will be gone through thoroughly by civil servants, the findings will be put on the desks of ministers, and ultimately they will be used to form policy and hopefully future legislation. But for the individual, how can you get your voice heard as well? I know it's not always easy as a parliamentarian to convey the message that we are here to help. I'm very conscious that I read the emails I receive from my own constituents. 
I weigh up opinion. I listen to both sides. And it's quite often on a whole myriad of issues. I will get both sides of the story told to me. And of course, it's my role not to listen to he who shouts loudest, but to look at the evidence, to look at the opinion and draw my own conclusions and act upon them. But I'm always aware that there are experts. Uh, I think it was a few years ago we'd heard that we'd had enough of experts, but I find that is very, very seldom the case. It's the expert voices. It's the people with lived experience. It's those on the ground who often know best, whether it's on a particular issue or whether in a particular locality. So if we use as an example, licensing of uh, sanctuaries and welfare establishments, rescue centres, we know that in many cases, it will be local residents who are aware of problems before they're apparent to any authority, before they're apparent to any other welfare organisation. And I think many of us can speak from experience. I know as a constituency MP that I've had my attention drawn to incidents where there have been welfare issues long before anybody has worked out who they need to report it to at the local council, whether they need to report it to World Horse Welfare, to the RSPCA. People will often turn to their local councillor, to their local member of parliament, or indeed to their elected representative in either the Welsh Senate or the Scottish Parliament. And it's absolutely imperative that people still have the confidence to do that, to know that their MP is elected to represent them, to raise issues with ministers, to take action on their behalf. And we all do it, day in, day out. While some may hold glamorous positions in government, actually, we are all constituency members of parliament. But I just wanted to give some advice on how best to engage, how best to set out your argument, if it is a policy change you're looking for, or how best to set out the problem, if it's actually something to do with a concern that you have in your local area. I always say, I will attend meetings with anyone, uh, various lobby groups, charities, a wide range of organisations will come to parliament to talk to me about the issues that are of concern. And I always, at the end of every meeting, ask, what do you want? What is it that you want me to do for you? Because I want people to come with their own shopping list, as it were, with three clear asks of something that I can do, a policy proposal for government, an issue that you want to have raised direct with the minister, or potentially, and I now say this with the experience of being a select committee chair, uh, a wider issue, a policy problem, concern, that you think could benefit from the close scrutiny of a select committee. Now, I know that the EFRA select committee is absolutely the one that your attention will be focused towards. Uh, chaired by an excellent colleague of mine, Neil Parrish, a man who absolutely understands rural issues, uh, the countryside, farming, and indeed equestrian matters. So it is always worth considering whether there is a a wide policy issue that needs really in-depth scrutiny, whether you approach the select committee and ask them to consider it. And they're a democratic process. I always say that, that my own select committee, we decide probably twice, maybe three times a year, what our future inquiries will be. And it won't all be on the chair of the committee's whim. Uh, I will go along with my suggestions, other committee members come along with theirs. We discuss, we debate, and we decide collectively what will be our priorities. And just because we don't have time on the agenda to look at something in this quarter doesn't mean that we won't look at it in the next. It's about making sure that the priority issues are absolutely brought to the fore. Now, I don't mean to uh, unduly flatter one of my fellow trustees, but through Brexit, we have seen a huge problem with uh, transport of animals, uh, unnecessary delays at the border, concerns about whether competing equestrians could get backwards and forwards to, uh, to the continent. And uh, I was absolutely happy to raise on the floor of the house with the DEFRA minister, Victoria Prentice, an issue that had been raised with me direct. And of course, that's the, uh, perhaps the, the ultimate way that a member of parliament can highlight an issue direct with the minister is by asking them a question on the floor of the house. If you haven't seen a Member of Parliament do that, that doesn't mean that they haven't raised it. 
We can also do so through written questions. We can do it via letter to the minister. And actually, what I find is really effective is to corner the minister in the lobby and just to say to them, look, I've had a myriad of concerns raised with me about X, whatever X issue is. I think most recently for Victoria Prentice, it was about pig farming and the challenges of getting uh, pigs to slaughter, the challenges of finding uh, hauliers who could move them around the country. And of course, the challenges of finding people prepared to work on agricultural enterprises at the moment. Uh, and it was a brilliant way of just saying to Vicky, please, can you help? Please do something more. I don't have the time, the ability, uh, and indeed in the particular instance I'm thinking of, I was chairing the session in Westminster Hall where she was having to respond. So I didn't have the ability from the chair to raise the specific issue of a pig farmer in my constituency, but I could still do it privately. And actually, as a minister, that really matters. The weight of colleagues' opinions sidling up to you and saying, hang on, there's a real problem here adds to the, uh, the public pressure, adds to the letters that you may see in the media, adds to the articles that are being written. MPs can very easily, ministers can very easily ignore headlines. That's a sad truth. And perhaps over the last week or so, we've seen that um, really highlighted. But what they can't ignore is questions in the house. The horror of going into the tea room and having every colleague in your ear about a particular issue. And that happens. And actually, that's a really important way to engage. When constituents write to us, we then go to the minister and make their life a misery until they've changed whatever the issue is that we want to change it. I have to say, I'm not a big fan of petitions, but you can always use that as a device. And if 100,000 people sign a petition, then it has to get airtime in Parliament. There'll be a debate sponsored by the Petitions Committee, which could be for as long as uh, three hours, but more likely to be 90 minutes or so. The minister will be required to respond, but actually does that bring about legislative change? No, not necessarily. And to be frank, it's far easier than trying to garner 100,000 signatures on an e-petition to write to an MP and ask them if they will sponsor an adjournment debate at the end of the day, that's 30 minutes uh, airtime for your issue on the floor of the house, or a debate in Westminster Hall, which can be 30 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes, or as long as three hours. And you'll find if there is a, a large number of uh, members of parliament that want to talk on a specific issue, you can very easily fill up three hours. You'll all have seen Prime Minister's Question Time on your televisions. Uh, I always say the least productive 30 minutes of our working week, where it's very rowdy, very noisy, and actually you don't get good answers to the questions. That's just a fact. Parliament at its best is often in Westminster Hall, where you'll get constructive, detailed debate from members of parliament who will actually know what they're talking about, who will go in because they have a particular expertise or interest in a subject. And you'll get a detailed response from the minister, 10 minutes or so of what they're doing, whether they've listened to the debate or not. I always, as a minister, try to pick up on the, the examples, the interests that were brought out in the debate and reflect upon them. Actually, not all ministers have great ideas and great ideas can come from backbench members. They can come from members of the opposition. And the best politicians are those who can actually listen and not just listen to answer, but listen to think, to reflect upon the issue, maybe take it away and come back with a better policy. So what really matters is that you get your voice heard, you identify who you want to listen to you and you be persistent. Uh, I like to know from my constituents what they're thinking. I also like it when they write politely with a set of reasonable asks and do so uh, in a timely fashion. So if you want legislation changed, if you want me to vote a particular way on a particular bill, let me know in good time. Please don't send me an angry email three minutes before the vote is due to be held because I simply won't have enough time to reflect upon your arguments. I hope some of this has been useful. I hope it's given some of you food for thought about how you might engage with the policy makers going forward. And I also hope that it shows to you that we are prepared to listen, that we can be constructive and helpful, and that parliament isn't just a, a place in Westminster where we have shouting matches the whole time, because that's very far from the truth.
Welcome back, everybody. We're just running about uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. It's a very tight schedule, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the, the day so far. We just, uh, before we get going with our next speaker, we'd like to ask your views again on another famous Slido poll, which worked quite well the first time, amazingly. Uh, this time, it's, the, it's very similar, actually, the second poll. Which of the following do you think plays the most important role in shaping most other people's opinions? No, so not, not your own, but other people's opinions on equine-related matters. And I think these are the same the same options that you had before, scientific evidence, experienced people in the industry, equine media, books. Um, there we are, coming up already. Family and friends, other owners at the yard, um, and past experience, that's another one too. So get involved with that, and we'll give you the, uh, the outcome of that poll uh, very, very shortly. But now, it's time to introduce our next speaker, who's got a real story here about the impact of the other people's opinions have on on people, especially when engaging in the sometimes fraught world of social media. So please welcome a lady who until quite recently was working for World Horse Welfare um, at Her Majesty's Highland Pony Stud. Uh, she's here today down from Scotland. She breeds Highland Ponies on her family farm. Please welcome Jordan Headspeeth. <laughs> Do you want some water, Jordan? Yeah, okay, my love. Your Royal Highness, Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jordan, Ginger Jordan. I have no idea why anybody calls me that. Um, and up until very recently, I worked at World Horse Welfare at Bell Wade Farm in Aberdeenshire, and I've been there for the last three years. My family and I breed a few pedigree Highland ponies, and it is one of them that I'm going to tell you a story about today. Does it work? For horse owners across the country, winter of 2021 was a tough one. It was horrible for months. However, some days looked like this, and other days started to look a bit like this. <laughs> the weather was so sporadic, and when we thought it really couldn't get much worse, Storm Darcy hit on the 7th of February. It caused chaos. It just felt like it would never stop snowing, trapped in this icy tundra forever. My ponies live out. I do that. You can see. And um, they seemed completely unfazed by the snow and wind. Safely tucked away behind their windbreak for shelter there. Uh, they didn't have much to worry about. I'd even put some rugs on them because I was feeling nice. Um, as the volume of snow was so vast, one of the locals kindly brought his digger into clear paths through the snow so the ponies could move around more easily. And one day when the weather had, the road had been cleared, the weather had changed, I took Nessie's field, Nessie's the pony I'm talking about today, uh, I took her field companion for an in-hand walk down the cleared road to stretch his legs. Leaving Nessie happily tucking into her hay, we wandered off. However, we were talking about horses and ponies having opinions, this little mare's got a lot of opinion, uh, Nessie took it upon herself to leave the safety of the windbreak and the snowplowed air of the field and decided that she was coming with us, no matter how deep the snowdrifts were. For a moment, panic washed over me as I thought that she would get stuck in the waist-high snow. However, the pucky little mare powered through. And as she powered her way alongside us back up the fence line, I took a short video of her. And without a second thought, when I got home that evening, I uploaded it to my Facebook page. And this brings me on to the story and why I'm standing here today. I captioned the video, Pony or Plough, Nessie, or Acnacone, Arizona, is our posh name, if there's any Highland Pony enthusiasts out there, um, will be venturing very far from her hay feeder today. Determined is the word I would use. <laughs> so I've uploaded the video. It's the following morning, and my days now look something like this. I head out the door in full Polar Explorer gear, jumpstart my van as the battery is dead because it's minus 23 degrees. My drive to work takes three times as long as the roads haven't been ploughed. The local council deemed the conditions too dangerous for their workers to be out in. This was my commute to the livery yard. 
I do my day's work at Bell Wade Farm, and from work I drive as far as my little van will go through the ice and snow. I abandon my van and walk the final two miles up and down and through the seemingly endless snowdrifts to get to the livery yard where my ponies live. So this is the road to the yard. That, that, where you can see between the trees and the fence, that was the commute. And here are the happy ponies at the end. I've brought flasks of hot water in my backpack to make their feeds warm. I'm really worried that they're not drinking enough due to the freezing conditions. I hang nets of haylage from their windbreak as I'm worried they need some different fibre going through their guts and I'm worried about the colic risk. I check they are dry on their rugs. I'm feeling very generous as they do not need them on and I top up the water trough. I give them a fuss and a scratch and I tell them how much I love them before I start on my mission home. Now at this point, getting to and from the yard genuinely feels like an expedition to the North Pole. Arriving home, I get myself defrosted and fed, fed before sitting down on my sofa and looking at my Facebook. There are lots of comments on my video, lots of positive comments, and then... Maybe. Never in a million years when I uploaded the video, I thought that people would be so alarmed or horrified or that they would judge my management of my ponies, let alone criticise me. I hurriedly start commenting back, correcting people, trying to make them understand the situation. This adds, fuels, this adds fuel to their fire and more negative comments pile in. And after defrosting my eyelashes with a hairdryer and somebody's telling me that I'm the cruel one. I didn't get death threats, but this is still extremely unpleasant. And after the day, days and winter that I've had, it's a kick in the teeth. There was a lot more comments, this is just a snapshot of some of them, and a lot of comments from people jumping to assumptions and conclusions as to why Nessie had ended up in snow as deep as she did. Saying things like, after working that hard to get to it, I think she deserves her hay. And what a tough life this pony has. So I started replying and explaining. I said she was clipped as you can see in the video, because she was in work before the snow arrived. You can also see in the video that she's not wasting away, she's quite chubby. Um, and I was being a very generous Jordan for even putting a rug on her. Um, and if you look closely in the video, you can see there is a plain interior fence that keeps her well away from the old barbed wire fence. I'd also like to highlight at this point, I'll put a different picture up, uh, is that being a Highland Pony, Nessie has 500 years of breeding behind her. The breed evolved in the 16th century and became adapted to the variable and often severe weather conditions of Scotland. I know this, yet I'm still sat on my sofa worrying. Maybe these people are right. Maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I should have chosen a livery yard with stables available. Maybe I should have bought them an actual field shelter. I know my ponies are fine. They are my pride and joy, but the self-doubt still creeps in. If this is what these people think, what do my friends and work colleagues think? What do the other liveries think? Am I not doing enough? I'm exhausted, but I don't sleep well that night. If I wasn't stressed enough about caring for my ponies, I've now been given this headache. In the morning, I removed the video from a few of the groups I posted it on that it caused the most trouble. And I reminded myself that these are just strangers on the internet. They have no idea how hard I work to keep these ponies happy and healthy. So many people jumped to conclusions as to why Nessie had ended up in snow as she, deep as she did. In fairness, I didn't explain the situation in the video caption, but I never thought I'd have to. I've, I was naive and I've learned a lesson. So please be mindful about how, where, and when it is actually useful to communicate your own opinions and judgments to others. Always be humble and kind, as you have no idea who is behind that computer screen and what they are going through. This experience has made me think twice before I upload anything to my social media pages, because in February, I uploaded that 12-second video to my Facebook, and now I am standing here. <laughs> so be careful. <laughs> You never know how these things might snowball out of control. Thank you. Jordan, that was terrific. Thank you so much and all, coming all the way down uh, from the Highlands to, to talk to us today as well. Um, a very powerful story about how easy it is to rush to judgment 
so how do we build up um, a resilience, if you like, uh, to this? Well, uh, the next uh, speaker will talk to us a bit about this in more detail. He's very well qualified to do so. Uh, please welcome uh, sports performance psychologist Charlie Unwin to talk to you, ladies and gentlemen. Charlie. Would you like some water? You want some water? Yeah, here you go. This is a fresh one. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Royal Highness, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. And Jordan, thanks so much for giving us that brilliant account of what it's like to be on the receiving end of something you had no uh, expectation of in the first place. Um, I suppose what I'd love to be able to do for you is to, just to provide um, maybe some answers, not necessarily in whose opinion matters, but how we can um, be more resilient to the opinions of other people, how, in fact, we can even work with the resilience and beliefs of other people uh, to be a force for good. Um, and my work allows me to work with some incredibly ambitious, highly driven individuals, not just from equestrian sports, sports in general, the business world, uh, and even the military world uh, as well. Uh, I'm not an expert when it comes to horses, uh, and I don't profess to be either. Um, I try to be more of an expert when it comes to humans, uh, and I think the two, the, the, the uh, amazing dynamic between the two is, is a very important one. Um, in fact, I spent most of my childhood trying to uh, get away from horses. I was brought up on a, a farm in the Suffolk countryside. Uh, I traded my first pony in for a motorbike. That didn't work very well. Motorbikes uh, don't smell the same. You can't hug a motorbike either. Uh, and actually, I found that horses were far more rewarding uh, to work with. Um, I got to the age of 21 and at university thought I've really got to sort of leave the pony club at this point. Um, and of course they extended the age at that point that you could be in the pony club. And um, I found myself in the army and commissioning into the Royal Horse Artillery. So horses remained around me uh, for, for a very long period of time. Uh, and during that time I became a modern pentathlete as well. And, uh, and I have to say, I'm not here to talk about modern pentathlon. Uh, I've only got 10 minutes, it's not enough. But however, what I would say is that I very much echo Pammy's thoughts on the current situation. I find myself holding back slightly, despite the fact that I've been asked to, to join numerous WhatsApp groups in the last 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, um, with athletes around the world rallying round. In largely in support uh, of a lot of the opinions out there, um, which I, I think are probably echoed very much by Pammy's. Um, what this does is it highlights to me an important message, that where humans are driven by ambitious goals, we have to be aware of the impact that those goals have on our partner, uh, which of course is the horse. And my job is very much to help people manage their ambition positively, to help them uh, be, uh, their ambition be a force and energy for goods that incorporates the horse as well. And when it's done well, it's done brilliantly. And I think there are lots of positive messages in here as well. Um, but seeing those scenes at the Tokyo Olympics reminds me of a wider message really here which is that it's essential that we don't allow our preoccupation with developing horses to eclipse the importance of developing and growing people as well. And that's really important in the equestrian industry. And I have to say that having worked in lots of industries, it's not always an area that the equestrian industry does well, uh, focusing and developing people. And confidence forms a large part of that. So I wanna share with you a few ideas about why confidence is so important, but more than that, how do we understand confidence? It's a big word and there's a lot tied up in it. Not least, I think it's very easy to focus on uh, people's knowledge and skills because these are more evident, they're more visible. If this was, a, uh, if this was an iceberg, then above the surface of the water peaks what we can see what social media allows us to visibly observe, but it hides a whole wrath of other stuff underneath, far more important influential stuff 
that leads us to uh, enact our knowledge and skills effectively or not effectively, as the case may be. So I want to focus on this stuff underneath, excuse me, I'll go back, uh, on, underneath the surface of the water. So confidence in self, um, the story that you tell yourself about yourself, self-esteem, self-belief, this plays a really important role, I think, in how we are resilient to the noise that we get from the outside world. Um, and this noise is something that I spend a lot of time helping athletes to manage uh, and deal with. Um, there was an amazing study done uh, in Toronto uh, a few years ago where they got a, a number of students to recall uh, or recite uh, a passage of information on statistical methods. And what the group didn't know is that half of them were given a passage which really made no sense. It was very incoherent. And they, uh, well, they measured the brain activity of these particular, these particular students as they, apologies, it keeps skipping forward without me asking, so I'll, I'll put it back there. Um, the brain activity of these students uh, who, who were reading this incoherent passage um, and because of the stress that they were kind of under, because they couldn't understand this and they had to stand up and recite it, uh, they showed a lot of threat avoidance behavior in the brain. In other words, brain patterns that are associated with not wanting to take risk, with not wanting to try for fear of failure. However, there were a subgroup of students who showed completely the opposite patterns. They showed what we call rewards um, uh, or acceptance of reward type patterns. So in other words, leaning into the challenge. And what they found was that these particular students scored highly when they were asked three questions. I can do things as well as most other people. I feel I have quite a lot to be proud of. And I take a positive attitude towards myself. Think how you would answer those questions if you had to score them out of 10. Those who scored high were able to overcome the challenges of incoherence. Uh, and for me, it, it, it raises a really important message. It suggests that self-esteem, self-belief, has a major role in the way that we are able to deal with uncertainty, ambiguity in the world around us, which I think includes the ambiguity of other people's opinions and feedback. It's also worth noting that I think 90% of feedback comes from inside of us, inside our own heads. We very often think that feedback is what the outside world gives us, but most of the feedback we experience is happening inside our own heads, the questions we ask ourselves. And if we're not asking ourselves the right questions, if indeed we're not compassionate with ourselves, if we're not accurate, in question ourselves, uh, I think we make ourselves vulnerable to the unsolicited opinions uh, of other people. Um, so, confidence in mind and knowing your own mind, as well as confidence in state, uh, become another area that I get involved with. I'm not going to talk about this uh, just through time, but being able to manage our physiology confidently is essential in helping us to manage our mind. These two are a complex dynamic. But in terms of confidence in mind, uh, I've just got a couple of uh, ideas that I just want to share you, with you. And knowing your own mind, that's what we're talking about here. Focus plays a really important role when it comes to knowing your own mind and where we place our attention. You see, it's really interesting that there's almost an assumption that when we get negative comments on social media platforms, our attention dives in to the negative comments and almost completely dismisses any other comments. A, a simple exercise that I like to get people to do, and now this is a riding example, but it can be taken in any context. We have the stuff in the middle, which ultimately is the stuff that you can control. It's the stuff that makes you good at what you do, done well. Uh, and so, stuff can be quite simple stuff as well. So, um, all of this stuff uh, is, is important to being able to control the moment, to own the moment rather than let the moment own you. Around the outside is all the things that we can't necessarily control for this particular competitive rider. Uh, and they're all things that tend to pay, uh, uh, play on our minds. Why? 
Because this, the things around the outside are things that we can't control. And our brain hates what we can't control. And therefore, this is how our brain perceives it. Why? Because the emotional brain that sort of kicks off uh, when it comes to highlighting things that we can't control, which includes other people's messages on social media, is about five times stronger than the rational, executive thinking part of the brain. And so therefore, this is how our brain is perceiving a situation that we should otherwise be in control with. Uh, and this is about perception. There are two things that are important here. The first thing is uh, being able to have choice over the way we think. We sometimes forget we have choice. And helping people practice their own choice is an important part of knowing their own mind. We have choice where we place our attention. It's not easy, I'm not pretending it is, but we can help people and train people to be better at making that choice. The other thing is acceptance. We can learn to accept what's on the outside. Uh, and in doing so, we take away the sting uh, of the impact that it can have. So those are two important elements of that. And very finally, I want to share with you this, because I'm passionate about working with coaches more so in the industry now, because I realize that I have only so much time. I would love to work with as many riders as I could, but I realize that the coaches are the ones out there doing a great job every single day and working with many, many more riders than I could ever work with. So part of what I've tried to develop at Centre 10 is a culture working with coaches where they apply good psychology to what they do on a daily basis. And this forms a really essential part of our philosophy towards working with other people. It's based off um, a model from Bern uh, called the Levels of Communication model. And uh, it basically starts with the foundations of any communication, which are ritual and cliche. How are you? As Brits, we love to talk about the weather very often. It's a ritual and cliche. It gets us into conversation. But then very quickly, we move above that to facts and information. And I think at that point, for many people, communication stops. If I provide the right facts and information, I've done my job. The problem is most organizations don't work well purely off facts and information. They have to be able to engage in the beliefs and opinions that make uh, people's perception real for them. Uh, and this is an important line between facts, information, and beliefs and opinions because what we try to do and what I'm taught as a psychologist is to listen, is never to judge someone for their opinion but rather to invite it and help them understand it for themselves. Uh, and I think coaches can do a great job in being able to do that. And also we have to remember that perception is reality for a lot of people. Therefore, if we judge other people for their opinions, we are literally putting up a barrier. And as a psychologist, if I do that, I lose the, the opportunity to help them change their opinions or beliefs. The moment we judge someone, we have to be careful about the language that we use. But done well, it can be incredibly powerful. You only have to sit someone down and get them to explore their beliefs and opinions, listen to them before they start saying, that doesn't sound quite right, does it? And they invite you to challenge them. So if we can't work with humans at the higher levels of communication, the levels that really drive our behavior, then we are only going to get so far. And it comes with risk. It feels risky talking on these levels. But it comes with huge amounts of trust as well. And if we can get more people trusting us and, and building relationships, then it will go a long way. Um, and I think probably finally, what's incredibly important for the equestrian industry is the need to collaborate, to talk to other people, to invite it internally before we start working out how we do that externally. If we're no good at inviting other people's opinions internally, how can we develop the mindset which allows us to do it externally? Self-development, helping people grow, get more confidence in what they do, and encouragement, helping people understand what they do well and why they do it well. More of this 
and I think we'll all be more resilient uh, to the opinions of other people. So I would just conclude uh, that psychological developments needs to be positive, it's not reactive. Good health is not the absence of bad health. It requires us to be proactive in how we lean into that. And I've heard some great messages, Nick, earlier on, I think shared that very sentiment uh, as well from a media perspective. But whatever you do, don't allow unsolicited opinions of others to stifle your ambition uh, and stop you from uh, doing what you love doing, what you're good at doing, uh, but be compassionate about uh, and for other people who are trying to do the same thing as well. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was absolutely fascinating. Please take a seat, and we're going to have a Q&A with uh, Charlie and Jordan as well, who's going to rejoin us um, for a Q&A. And once again, submit your questions, ladies and gentlemen, using the, the Slido. That would be, that would be great. Um, just forgive me while I get this up and running again. Here we go. We should have them coming through now. Two fascinating and very different experiences there. And uh, actually, what, one thing I wanted to ask you straight away, Charlie, um, almost like knowing your own mind, um, it's so, it, 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 we'd all like to do what you've just suggested there, but for some people, it's not as straightforward as others, is it? That's for sure. No, I think the challenge is that we wait for something bad to happen before we think about how we best deal with it. Uh, and for me, as I mentioned there, psychology and, and mental training needs to be very proactive. It needs to be part and parcel of how we live our everyday lives. It shouldn't just turn up at the point at which we need it the most. Um, so learning to challenge yourself and be good with challenge uh, on a daily basis, in all walks of life, uh, I think is probably the most important thing there. Question for you here, Jordan. Um, this has come through. How can people protect their own mental health when social media can turn nasty so quickly? H how did you cope? We heard about what had happened to you. I think you just need to be prepared for the backlash. I was completely blown away as I never even thought that anybody would have anything negative to say about that video of Nessie. Um, so I think, yeah, being, pre being prepared and sharing it maybe on um, social media where you know you maybe got it to a close group of friends or, you know, reassessing how private your privacy settings actually really are. Um, and yeah, as Nick was maybe saying earlier, knowing your audience, knowing who you're showing it to. And if you're putting it out into Facebook groups that are open to the public, full of other horsey people, then of course you are going to come across that. So I think being, being prepared definitely helps. Um, that's what I would say. Do you, do you feel as though you've come through the other side, okay? Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> I think <laughs> Maybe you when I uh, get <laughs> <laughs> um, One for you, Charlie. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the issues we can't control? Um, gentleman says, I've heard it said that 90% of what we worry about is never going to happen or never happens. Um, a great deal of unnecessary stress then. So how do we learn to focus on, on it properly, mm. on positivity? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it's probably, it probably takes up 90% of our attention because we can't control it, and that's the thing. Uh, with that exercise there I showed you around the bubble, there's something about being very explicit about what we can't control. It, so that's very different to saying ignore what you can't control. So I'm not saying ignore what you can't control. The more upfront you are, the more you recognize it, the more in your mind you make a deliberate choice not to control it. I notice this, I'm aware of this, but I choose, uh, I recognize that I can't control it. And by doing that, it, it sort of disarms the, the impact that that has. And as I say, a five times negative bias our brain is wired with, purely for survival reasons. It's more important, you know, as uh, we're walking through the Serengeti and we hear a rustle in the bushes, it's more important to assume the worst than it is to be curious. <laughs> uh, so, so you can see why we've evolved to be like that. The important thing, though, is that we recognize that slight sort of fallacy in our, in our way of thinking and that we're deliberate, we lean into that and just notice it in ourselves. But we're all the products of our own backgrounds, aren't we? That's the thing. I mean, I, I know that you've, you've served as a soldier uh, on duty in, in Iraq. Yes. Yeah, and this all helps to forge the way you think about things. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I very much, my army background holds me in, in great stead, I think, for a lot of this. And I've learned a lot of lessons uh, from that, uh, not least in the idea of leaning into challenge and being able to sort of train ourselves with that. But if I can kind of go back to, uh, to a linked point around controlling what you can control with social media, in 2012, um, they, uh, around the world, certainly in Western countries, they saw a huge spike in anxiety. Um, and they couldn't really work out what the spike was related to and until they realized that it was the year that social media platforms became integrated on mobile technology. In other words, we could carry social media around with us everywhere we went. Uh, Nick said he would never look at Twitter before going to bed. Absolutely, I mean, that, that would be the worst thing you could do. And we kind of intuitively know that. Uh, but the fact that it's there in our pocket, these opinions exist, and our mind's aware of that. Mm. It's not stupid, and unconsciously, it's playing on that. But without doubt, those with good social media habits, turning it off three days before competition has had a profound effect on the performance of a lot of the riders that I've worked with. Right, fascinating. Um, back to what we were talking about earlier on, in fact, in a way here, Jordan. Um, a little bit more about how you dealt with what you went through. Can a social media storm of negative opinion be turned into an educational opportunity? Oh, absolutely, without a doubt. I think you can always take away, you know, I think it's healthy to always take away a positive from a situation. Um, and I, people say with, kind of, with failure, failure is a, an opportunity to learn and grow and develop. So I definitely learned a lesson by, you know, what happened. Um, with the negative backlash I received after that video. Um, and yeah, it just makes, you know, makes you a bit more set up for dealing, you know, so much more of our life is on the internet and on social media. It means so much more to all of us. Um, and yeah, it's learning how to work with it. I suppose we're kind of learning and developing all the time as it grows and develops too. YouTube are out there and getting in touch with us as well. We've got plenty of questions from, from people out uh, who aren't with us today here at the Royal Geographical Society. Um, do you have any top tips, Charlie, on how we can ensure we don't become part of the problem in a sense that it's all too easy to share something on social media without realizing we may not have the full story? I think we've heard some fantastic tips already in terms yeah. of how the media do it, for example, and, and, and really checking and thinking about that. Um, I, perhaps even categorizing the contents that you put out, recognizing where you are offering opinion or something that would invite opinion, um, and just being much more sensitive to those particular pieces of content. Because let's face it, 99% of content is great. It's funny, it's, it's entertaining, it's engaging. Um, and we shouldn't let the, the sort of one, two uh, percent put us off doing that. Um, but like I say, good tech habits, are perhaps, part of what's really important here. I, I spend a lot of time working with riders on, and indeed coaches on how they, uh, how they have a, a, a strategy around their social media. I don't mean a business strategy for getting more followers. I mean a strategy about how you let it manage your, your how you mentally manage yourself around social media. Mm. And having a clear sense of how you do it, uh, I think can help you make the right decisions more intuitively. In interesting, because there's another question which touches on that, Jordan. Uh, the most successful strategies for defusing the kind of problem that you faced. Can you, can you remember, in particular, what worked for you in coping with that onslaught of negative opinion? Not getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting involved. As Did Pam you share with other friends and family about what yeah, you were going so through? Yeah, so I actually shared with my work colleagues, which is yeah. why I'm here today. Um, but I think, yeah, sharing that with them and offloading and sometimes talking through what's happened um, and seeing, you know, you can get somebody else's, like when I was speaking to my work colleagues, they were, it's easy when you're looking at a situation from the outside looking in and sometimes that's what you need to help um, you kind of see through it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Charlie, uh, can you give us any examples of how we can challenge ourselves mentally? <laughs> the easy I, ones. I, I take cold showers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's very in vogue at the moment. Uh, but seriously, oh, I didn't mention much about the, the, the confidence and state. But of course, challenge comes with a, phys a physiological activation of our nervous system. And uh, if our response to challenge is to somehow suppress that physiological challenge that we get, that feeling we get inside, we actually, what we're doing is, is we're taking ourselves further away from being able to adapt positively to stress. 
Science now shows that uh, uh, there are two types of uh, adaptation to challenge. One is uh, fight or flight, we, we all know that, but not good, it's very reactive. But the other is what I call the challenge response, which is actually being able to, to lean in to challenge, to, to invite challenge, but with clear focus and structure. Um, if people aren't focused, it, it, it's very difficult to deal with challenge because we become much more reactive. So having a clear plan, going into various situations, but also just practicing focus. Things like meditation work because they help us enhance the quality of our focus. And me it means that our mind doesn't deviate as it wants to off, off the path that we're choosing. Um, so there's a lot that we can do, but a lot of it's indirect, and therefore it's not as obvious that that's helping us in these other areas. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Charlie Unwin and Jordan Hesweet, thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. you can relax now, Jordan. <laughs> OK, thank you so much. Um, oh, Charlie, they're your notes. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, everybody. And uh, thank you for your questions, whether they were from you out here or uh, via YouTube. Um, now, uh, Time to re reveal the results of our second poll here before we move on to the discussion panel um, about what you felt was the most important role in shaping most other people's opinion on equine-related matters. Well, what a surprise, ladies and gentlemen. Um, social media at the top. Other owners at the yard. Experienced people in the industry, past experience, Dr. Google, family and friends, and uh, no votes at all for equine media. Tells us a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, right, our discussion at panel today, uh, Your Royal Highness, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, for whose opinion matters, which will include uh, a chance for you to ask some questions at the end of it as well. I'd like to introduce our panel members, some of which are here with us in person today. A couple of them aren't. They're joining us from the Americas. May I welcome to the stage, first of all, uh, Sarah Cox. She's joining virtually, is she? Oh, thanks for letting me know, really. That's great. <laughs> I was looking forward to seeing Sarah again. Anyway, Sarah, <laughs> it's great to see you there. A well-known radio and TV presenter in the UK who currently presents Drive Time on Radio 2, uh, BBC Radio 2 here in the UK from 5 till 7, and also presents Between the Covers on BBC 2 Television. That's a program about books, ladies and gentlemen, OK? Um, lifelong love of animals, Sarah, and uh, I believe that stemmed from growing up on your parents' farm up in Lancashire. Welcome to you, Sarah. Nice to see you. You can give her a round of applause, if you like. <laughs> we, <laughs> also on the screen there, we welcome Dr. Kami Haleski, who joins us virtually from the bluegrass state of Kentucky, where she's an equine lecturer at the University of Kentucky. She specializes in equine behavior and welfare, horse-human interactions, and working equids in the world's developing regions. Uh, she also enjoys dressage with her Arabian gelding MSU Ducati. Welcome to you, uh, Cami. It's great to see you here. <laughs> and uh, Mariano Hernandez-Gil, um, who's about 2,000 miles southwest of you, Cami, down in Mexico City, uh, associate professor at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, who has a long-standing link to world horse welfare. Uh, because uh, of his involvement with the donkey sanctuary in Mexico, stemming back a number of years. Mariano believes the, in the good practices with the good science and the combination of the science of welfare for welfare. I think I've got that right, um, to promote welfare in practice. He's now looking at collaborative initiatives to help the veterinary profession. So welcome to you. Bienvenido, Mariano. Thank you. Thank you. And... Joining us here at the Royal Geographical Society, Dr. Neil Hudson, who's been Conservative MP for Penrith and the Border since 2019, but started life off as a vet, and is the first vet in the House of Commons, I believe, since 1884. That's not bad going. Um, he studied at Cambridge and the University of Sydney, and was Senior Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh at Royal School of Veterinary Studies, uh, before he went full-time into politics. 
strong interest in animal welfare and rural affairs and also in science and as a member of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee. Welcome to you, uh, Dr. Hudson. And Dr. Chris Tufnell, a long-standing trustee of World Horse Welfare. Good to see you, Chris, who's been a practicing vet veterinary surgeon for over 20 years and since 2005, he has been the owner of the Coach House Vets near Newbury, uh, which is an equine and, vet and pet veterinary practice and was previously president of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. He's also made numerous charity visits to Africa and India uh, in the past and continues to do so. Welcome to you as well, Chris. <laughs> right, um, so on to our first discussion question, um, which is, given that equine welfare can be seen as shades of gray, and science as black and white, should science ever, ever be disregarded? Um, I'm going to give that to you first, Cami, if I may. I'm going to read that again. Given that equine welfare can be seen as shades of grey and science in black and white, should science ever be disregarded? I actually worked on an article with an ethicist, Dr. Raymond Anthony. This was maybe 10 years ago. And the title of the article was, When Science Alone is Not Enough, Trying to Add in an Ethical Assessment. So I do think there are times where science doesn't tell us the whole picture. I think there are definitely times we need to add in that ethical assessment. It's like you look at the evidence, but then you weigh, sometimes it's just like what you feel in your heart. It's like, this does not feel fair to this horse. I don't necessarily have the science to document it yet. And I think of some of the training methods when I go around to horse shows, um, at least in the US, and I watch some of the practices that are going on in the warm up pen. We don't necessarily have science to say, oh, that practice is super wrong. But ethically, you can look at it and say, that is not fair to the horse. So I, I do think there are times that the science won't give us the full answer and we have to bring in an ethical assessment. Mariano, would, would, you, would you tend to agree with that, Mariano? Yes, I agree. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I, I have a very recent experience with uh, a dressage course from a, uh, which belongs to a couple of friends. When I was a uh, young a child, I, I have a very strong opinion in my life, which was my great grandfather's opinion. And when we were riding horses and he noticed that the horse uh, was uh, flagging the tail or crooking the tail, uh, he used to say, hey, could you please have a look on how the saddle is fitting? And could you please um, um, accommodate the, the pad? I don't know. Then we did it. Then uh, that was 30 years ago. And it was my great grandfather's uh, opinion and knowledge. And recently, uh, a couple of friends who have a very good, uh, beautiful black uh, horse uh, for the dressage were having a, a behavior problem with the, the, the horse. The horse was um, rearing, and it was even dangerous for, for him, for the rider. Then her, his sister, told me, uh, what could we do with his his nutrition, with the horse's nutrition to, to remove this energy. And I said, well, pr probably everything, this was by phone. And, and I, I, I told her, is the horse moving the tail? Is the horse, um, is the saddle fitting well? Uh, could you, could your bet please have a look on the, on, on the, on the back of, of your horse? Then they checked the back, they checked the saddle fitting and, and the behavior problem and the danger for the rider disappeared. Then for me, it was a great experience of uh, a combination of uh, science and, and empirical, no, empirical knowledge and how we solve the uh, uh, human horse relationship uh, to, to make it uh, uh, more effective and, and long lasting. And then it's a way in which science and science should pay attention on what experience says and the experienced people should accept that science is demonstrating many things which should be applied. Thank you very much Mariana, thank you. Um, Neil, I'm going to throw this over to you now as well. What, what are your thoughts about this? 
I think um, very much we should not disregard the science. I think, we, it's, as, as has been said earlier, it's important to make evidence-based decisions. But the, the science has to be the platform for that. But you, we should not be afraid to critique the science. And so scientific papers are peer-reviewed, and there are discussions in the paper. So when you're reading a paper, you will evaluate that. But I think we should critique the science. And, and in, in my sort of transition now from a, a you know, scientist, clinician, vet into politics, uh, scientists make uh, advice to, to politicians and then ultimately policymakers then have to make judgments on that. And we've seen that in sharp relief with the COVID pandemic. And you will see different decisions taken in different parts of the world and different decisions taken in different countries in the United Kingdom. And policymakers will be held accountable for that, that they have to make the judgment on the best scientific advice. But I think the important thing to remember, and as a vet, if you've got a horse in front of you and the treatment protocol is not working, you take diagnostic tests and you are then be prepared to change that course of treatment and make the best evidence-based decisions. And I think in, in all walks of life, you should be prepared to change your mind and 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 change the path that you're going along. And that's not a weakness, that can be a strength. So we shouldn't, we should have the science as the basis, but be not afraid to change your mind moving forward. I was going to ask you as well, Chris, I mean, in your long career, have you been faced with uh, balancing these, these different arguments and uh, with, with science and, and the feel as you've gone through your experiences? Uh, definitely. I mean, we're, we're persistently challenged in, in practice by, uh, uh, opinions and, uh, dare I say it, facts that are, are, are formed on somewhat dubious opinions uh, that challenge scientific fact. We, we use the language quite loosely here because what we mean by science in this context is scientific fact. Science is just a method for getting to sci scientific fact. And, and there's good and bad science. And, and I can recommend Ben Goldacre's book, Bad Science, if you're not familiar with the sort of things I'm talking about. But there's a thing called a hierarchy of evidence, which shows the sort of quality of the science that, and uh, scientific fact that you're looking at and, and whether you can rely on it. And if you want to amuse yourself, go to a website that looks at spurious correlations, because we, we're all told regularly that correlation doesn't mean causation. But uh, if you go to the spurious correlation site, you'll see that uh, consumption of cheese in the US is very finely correlated with deaths from entanglement in bedsheets. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, but a lot of my clients will, will correlate uh, what they're seeing and what they're doing uh, and assume that they're, they're, they're the magic turning the horse to the moon every night is in fact curing the, the problem that they're dealing with. So um, yes, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's, it's a communication challenge. And, 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 how, and how do you deal with it? It must be quite, it's not easy. Uh, no, it's, certain people. It, it, it's, it's definitely not easy, and sometimes you're best just to go stum when asked your opinion on something that, that you're not necessarily happy with. I have found uh, challenging uh, Russian healing blankets and um, uh, various uh, contraptions, black boxes and everything is often not healthy when it comes to keeping clients. I, I, tend, to, uh, <laughs> I tend to just sort of let, let everything go silent for a bit and then cut in with what, what I'm going to say. My clients know what my opinions are, but if they actually get them out of me, sometimes they don't like what they hear. Okay, and that's not easy. Sarah, I'm going to bring you in here. Uh, any, any little scientific avenues you've explored in, in looking after your own horses? Well, I guess I'm a fan of a big dose of gumption combined with science. My uh, riding teacher, we were noticing that my horse nearly wasn't quite bending around to the left nice, and no matter what I was doing, what aids I was trying to give her, how I was trying to help her. And um, my riding teacher, Elaine, suggested uh, a brilliant osteopath who came along and worked with Nellie and worked, found she had a big tangle of, um, sort of stiff muscles all along her back. And that's what was not letting her just loosen up a little bit. So I guess that's my only experience of it. I mean, Nellie now, obviously, you know, she gets new shoes every five weeks. She's got an osteopath. She gets massaged. She gets bathed. I mean, she's, she's much better looked after than I, than I look after myself. An interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, often, often our pets are better looked after than when we look after ourselves, it seems, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, there's, there's definitely... 
there's definitely a pecking order in the house. And let's just say uh, my husband knows where he is in that pecking order with all the animals. <laughs> and <kids. laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. OK. Um, we're going to move on to our second point then, I think now. Um, and I'm going to open it up to you first of all here, Chris, if I may. How can we and others be encouraged to seek views beyond our own echo chambers in order to be more open-minded to change? How can we do that? Well, it's clearly a huge challenge, but I think there are three things that are really important. Firstly, I think we should set an example. And um, Spending less time on anti-social media isn't, isn't a bad thing. I, I actually came off uh, social media in the first lockdown, and I'm still waiting for the, the peril that uh, Tammy has predicted me. Um, some will notice I still have a Twitter account because um, I have 1,000 followers, and my vanity will stop me closing down my Twitter account <laughs> and having to build it up again. Um, but I've always wanted to put at the bottom of posts on social media I think you'll find it's more complicated than that. Um, because almost it would apply to almost every post. But I think setting an example of listening to people and setting an example of uh, paying for uh, the facts and, and informed opinions that, that we, we take in. I think the other thing is to try and persuade others to set an example. And I, I'm afraid, I don't feel that leadership in this country has set a very good example uh, recently. I think that we need to get back to a point where we show that collaboration and cooperation um, are, are really achieving results. Um, I, I do fo follow, to follow the political media, and, and so much gets done, and I'm sure Neil's one of these, these uh, politicians, by uh, backbench politicians cooperating across the House, and yet you wouldn't necessarily see that if you just look at what the, the leaderships are doing. Um, polarisation is toxic, uh, it's simplistic, and it's childish. Uh, and it's, it's very sad to see the example that, that, that's being set. set. So if we, if we can persuade those in positions of influence uh, to set an example too, that would be great. And uh, I would say, to educate the young, it's been mentioned se several times that education is so important. And building up a, an informational intelligence is really important. But uh, I've got two sons, and, and they spend a lot of time on social media and uh, a lot of time laid on their back looking at phones about 50 centimetres away from their face. And um, I can tell you that their bullshit monitors are really highly tuned. Uh, they are much better at knowing when they're being fed rubbish and find it hugely amusing. And I, I'm often saying to them, I don't think you, need, you should really pay much attention to that. And they laugh at me as if I'm <laughs> sort of insulting them by suggesting that they would have taken any opinion of that. That can't be easy, Chris. But anyway, um, Sarah, back to you. I know you, you, you've obviously got family as well. Um, is, is, that, is that a scenario that sounds fairly familiar to you too? Yeah, I mean, I can't talk to my 11-year-old daughter. She doesn't stay still anymore because she's just constantly doing a TikTok dance. So you just say, right, what do you want for your tea? And she's going... And she's just constantly doing this. They are on TikTok a lot. Uh, but, you know, the last... 18 months or so, uh, I've been I've been quite grateful for the screens, to be honest, especially with my son will be playing computer games and will be hooked up with a few of his friends remotely. And that was the only way he could socialise for quite a long time. Uh, he was shooting zombies whilst chatting with his mates, but I'd hear him roaring with laughter from his bedroom. So it, it was lovely, I, you know, that sort of side of things. It can actually be quite positive. For myself with social media, I, I use it for content for the radio and I try um, and keep it uh, light and airy. Never ask for opinions. Sometimes you get given opinions and advice. I don't want it. I'll just try and keep it light and fun on social media because as we learned from Jordan, it can quickly spiral out of control. Cammy, can I bring you into this conversation now uh, in Kentucky? Um, how can we be encouraged to seek uh, more open-minded uh, views to change, do you think? particularly in the States, how would it evolve there? Um, I think one thing that actually I find important is to, on purpose, consume a certain amount of course-related social media each day. Uh, I have two to three courses that I teach college students each semester that have a, a heavy piece on course welfare assessment, course behavior assessment and bringing ethics into that. 
And it's super helpful for me to be tuned into some of the Western disciplines, barrel racing, the racing world, English disciplines. Um, if I know what's going on out there, I'm much more likely to come up with intriguing case studies for my students. Now I have to pick and choose my battles very carefully in terms of what I might decide to engage with regarding social media. Uh, because with my students, I actually have them for a whole semester. And I build up a certain amount of credibility before I start trying to get into the tricky opinions. To just chime in once in a while on a social media conversation can be far more challenging to have any impact. Thank you very much, Cami. I can understand that. And Mariano, I suppose it's the same all over the world, this, isn't it? Yes, it is, yes. And um, I, I would add that, uh, well, um, in many areas, especially where they are working with, uh, well, the social media are not working so well. Um, and then the, the, you have to use other, um, other strategies to involve the people and to encourage the people and is uh, participating with the communities and with the people who rely on the equids for any, any aspect. It could be working equids or it could be sport equids, uh, but and most of that people, uh, well, they could be involved in social media, but not to learn then or to change a, an attitude or to facilitate a process. They are just to, well, to show uh, some type of success because a friend of mine in Mexico says that success has lots of, of, of parents, but uh, the opposite of success is orphan. Then, uh, and then social media are just to show success and to show how good things are going. But when things are going bad, we, we, we don't know. We, 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 don't, we, uh, we don't get aware uh, unless it is a crit criticism. And, and it is very difficult to change the things by criticism. We have to, to work in a more participative approach with the communities. And when I say community, it's not uh, only a rural community. It could be a community of dressage riders or show jumping riders to change the, the, the attitudes and to inform more the people about what science is testing and demonstrating and about how their experience is good to to feedback the science. Thank you, Mariano. Um, Neil, I suppose it's being open-minded to change is part and parcel of being a successful politician in a way, isn't it? It's part of the package, I guess. Um, I'm very early on in my political career, so you yeah. can judge success, I guess, at some other point in time. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 we've been talking a bit about the echo chamber of social media, and as an equine vet, I dabbled in, in social media a little bit. And, you know, as having treated many horses for ragwort toxicity, you know, highlighting the, the concerns about ragwort, and, had, and then saw the reply function, people who said that I was scaremongering, that side of things, and you could get into a bit of a debate. I have to say, nothing prepared me, though, for when you become a member of parliament, then the vitriol you get on social media. And I have been absolutely shocked by it. I mean, it is, it's a dreadful world there in terms of that. And, and I just really wish that we had a little bit more respect and, and tolerance in that. And we need to be able, moving forward, to be able to listen to, to people. Um, I'm the only vet in the Commons, there's one in the Lord, so it's, it's quite a lonely place in that sense. But that, what gives me heart is that animal welfare, as you can see in the audience today and in the House of Commons, the House of Lords and around the world, animal welfare is something that unites us in humanity, that we all care deeply about um, animals. And as Chris touched on, I think it's so important to, to try and build bridges across political uh, divides as well. And, and I think animal welfare is an area that we can do that cross party. I think I was really touched from, from what, what Jordan said as well, that, that it's so important that we need to try and be kind in this world. And I think social media especially, just we need to be kind, we need to be tolerant and have a respect that someone might have a different opinion to you. And I take it you're not using your office to treat Larry the cat. 
right now. Um, I did. I, I, I went to a reception in number 10 a couple of weeks ago, and he was outside. And I, I managed to get him to come up to me, but when I tried to tickle him under the chin, he just legged it. So Larry has passed his comments on me. <laughs> I want to sit with you, actually, Neil, on this one, on the third question, which is this. It's at the third point of our discussion. How can we keep equine welfare on the radar of policymakers, enforcement agencies, and more broadly, the general public, when there are so many competing priorities. How do we do that? Yeah, I think it's so important to keep uh, equine welfare, animal welfare on everyone's radar. So uh, my advice to people would be do what you are doing now. Just keep banging on about it as well. Um, I'm probably showing my age, but I do quite enjoy Radio 4's Just a Minute. And so there's the rules about um, hesitation, deviation and, and repetition. And I think my advice would be to break some of those rules of Radio 4. Don't hesitate. Bring it up. Talk about it. Be prepared to deviate. And this is where I really would break the Radio 4 just a minute rule, is repetition is good. Keep repeating yourself. Um, I keep banging on in the House of Commons about lots of animal welfare issues, and I sit on the EFRA Select Committee, and I'm, I'm getting a reputation now for being repetitive. I was on the, the, animal, the animal welfare kept... Um, animals bill committee this week and I was making points and the minister said Dr Hudson is, is making his points as he often does make and I, I just think you have to sometimes keep repeating yourself and that way you will get traction if something's important just keep saying it and I think that's my advice to keep it on the radar do what you're doing engage with policymakers. when EFRA committee has an inquiry feed into it world horse welfare is great for that Rowley comes and, and is, a, is an oral witness for us, they put in written presentations. So when bills are going through Parliament, when there are inquiries on select committees, do not be afraid to put forward your voice with that. And I think that's, that's so important to just keep repeating. If you feel strongly about something, don't be afraid to say it, and don't be afraid to say it a few more times than once. So be the squeaky wheel, eh, Chris? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, um, I think... Uh, it is important to be um, repetitive and keep at, at things. I mean, hell, we have to, don't we, to get, get things to happen. Um, but we, we clearly need to look for the, the uh, in, a, in a very noisy world, we need, need to look for the oi in every story, don't we? We need to look for something that's going to, to grab people. Um, I mean, on the enforcement agencies, they're, an awful lot of them are really poorly funded and very hard stretch on the, the work they've got to do. And, and so under, helping them to understand, one, the importance of equine welfare, because it's so often tightly entwined with human welfare. So it, 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 dealing with equine welfare problems will deal with human welfare problems too. And so understanding the, the, the relevance and importance of it, but also helping them to do their job. If you, if you can make the job easy for them by doing some of that job for them, then, then we're going to make that easier. And I, I know uh, um, World Horse Welfare certainly do. Um, as far as the public's concerned, I think it's really important to ensure that we're not just focusing on the outliers. I, I think in the, the horse world, we're, we're very good at preaching to the converted. Mm -hmm. And we're all worthily sitting there and nodding and going, yes, this is absolutely right. And, and also, agonizing about the people the, the other end of the spectrum if you like who, who we're never going to convince they they're determined that people should never ride horses or never keep horses or whatever and they're going to be difficult to convince but there are a lot of people in the in the middle who are, are relatively uninformed and and if we can just keep at them and keep providing information and and T uh, Tammy's absolutely right it wants to be humorous it wants to be entertaining but it wants to be informative um, and that'll do and keep, enga keep them engaged too. I'm going to ask Mariano um, how, how it is from his point of view down there in, in South America about um, keeping equine welfare on the, on the radar of policy makers. How is it for you? No. I, I would say that by um, showing the benefits of welfare, I mean, we are, many people are convinced about the the, the need of welfare from the biological point of view for the animal. But for many people, sometimes we have to show them the economical point of view, the way in which uh, uh, the welfare in an animal uh, is good to satisfy the need 
because of the of the person or the uh, is 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 using or is relying on the animal if even if it is a hen or a cow or a horse uh, the human is looking for a benefit from the animal then uh, if we show the, the the benefit in the society of having good uh, uh, relationships with animals uh, through welfare then we uh, many people get convinced uh, i remember another uh, uh, anecdote in my life and during a um, during an um, an interview with someone who wanted to get enrolled in, in a job on welfare he was talking a lot about the the, the theory of welfare then he was asked um, well okay let me know all all that you are saying tell me how would you put it into practice and he didn't know how to what to answer and since then i said well it is very important to show now talking for example i would like to take as an example the the people involved in education for future veterinarians then when you come to vet students to talk about welfare they say okay he's spreading the word of welfare i would like to know how to treat animals and if you show them how welfare is good in your practice as a veterinarian and how you help to to satisfy the need to the people relying on those animals then the for in this case the curriculum at the vet schools could change towards welfare not as a uh, not as a uh, just as some a, a, a matter but as a practice thank you cami i suspect that equine welfare is is quite a well supported and understood concept in kentucky well it certainly gets a lot of attention brought to it, at least in the Lexington bluegrass region of Kentucky. Um, you know, if, if we focus on the racing world, there are a lot of those topics that get brought to legislators, for example. Sometimes I feel like they're moving in a good direction. Sometimes I sort of question the direction. So the racing has got a lot of attention and some of it is having to do directly with this social license concept of how can we keep the public content with how we take care of, of racehorses. Um, and I'm actually a person that thinks there are many, many aspects of the horse racing world um, that are actually really good if I compare it, especially to other disciplines. Now, answering in a different way, a different niche area, would be working equids. Um, you know, Mariano and I, for example, have worked together on some working equid projects. It is it is so hard to have these working equids, which are over 80% of the equids in the world, and trying to get policymakers not to just think of them as completely invisible. So I, I kind of live these two disjointed worlds of the horse industry. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, I'm going to throw it to you. We, we, we all know that you are you, into your horses. Um, how do you think somebody like you can, can use your position as a, as a, as a well-known broadcaster to, to spread the word of, of equine welfare to those that make decisions and policies? Well, I think it goes back again to social media because as an ambassador of World Horse Welfare, I've made videos before uh, alongside my horse, Nelly. She's obviously been the more professional performer and we put them on Instagram, encouraging people to sponsor one of the World um, Horse Welfare, one of the stables. So to try and raise awareness of the work that they do and try and get it out. You know, there's a great, um, it's a, a great horsey community on both Twitter and Instagram. And like you say, it's, uh, you know, it's winning. You can win them over easily, but also spreading the word further as well for people to have their support. And of course, on Twitter, there's uh, so many petitions that you can retweet and that if I, I can get behind and I will uh, sign the petition to get it raised in the House of Commons if it's to do with animal welfare and then put that out to my followers and try and encourage them. So then I think if it if it gets above, I think 100,000 uh, signatures, then it will be uh, it will be raised in the House of Commons. So that's that's a good way in there of trying to get our voices heard. I guess you, you can utilize the power of social media. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before we get on to questions from the floor, is there any other comment you wanted to make about this particular topic, gentlemen, next to me in the 
in the RGS, or are you? No, I think I think I think Sarah summed it up well. I think yes. I, it, it, if if a take-home message can be about social media, that it actually can have a positive role as well, that we can harness the good, um, then that will be a good take-home message. I think we've social media has been the, they've been the two most uttered words maybe this afternoon, but. They ca it can be for the good as well as for the bad. So, well, I mean, I've always said to a lot of people, I mean, although I've disengaged from it because I seem to be fairly busy doing other things, we often blame the tool. I mean, a knife cuts up a tomato for breakfast and it also, or lunch and it also murders people, but mm -hmm. it's, it, the knife isn't the problem. So uh, it, 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 saying social media is good or bad is, is very difficult. There are good and bad things on it. I like that analogy, actually, Chris, and I also love the one about the cheese and the blankets, which was... <laughs> was I, I'm taking that from today. Don't try that at home. Don't try it at home, exactly. <laughs> now, um, questions. Questions from the audience, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our, our fantastic panel spread across the, across the two hemispheres. Um, right. I'm going to start reading these out now, see what we've got here. Um, well, funnily enough, it's about almost what we've been talking about for the last uh, few minutes. Um, there will be more than 50 different organisations gathered in this room. How do these organisations distill the public's opinion and develop good policies to build a better social acceptance of horse sport? Oh, go on, Neil, I'll give that <laughs> one to you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one because I think everyone is... Everyone loves the horse, um, but people have different views as to what that horse should be used for. And, and um, you know, to give the analogy in, 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 in horse racing as well, that, um, you know, some people want the, ho the, the, the sport to be stopped, but some people want it to carry on. And people in the racing industry love and care about horses, and people outside of the racing industry who want it stopped love and care about horses. So it's, it's very difficult to get a consensus, but I think... If we can keep the heart at the heart of the matter, the horse's health and welfare, and I'm talking the physical health of the horse, but also the mental well-being of the horse, and also we shouldn't underestimate the positive benefit that those horses have on people and their mental health and physical health as well. And if we keep that concept at the heart of what we do, um, mental health and welfare of both the animal and the, and the, the, the human, then we can make constructive, positive decisions moving together. Mm, thank you. Thank you. If you yeah, want to add something I'm, to that, Chris. I, I, I echo much of what Neil said already. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, I think it's important to listen to the concerns that are being raised very carefully, and, and certainly at World Health Welfare, we talk an awful lot about the social contract and, and, and understanding that for things to be permissible in society, we have to be listening to, to other people's opinions. I think we need to be careful not to hold on to some of the things that we think are traditional and, and, and should carry on. I, some of the language we use, to be honest, is, is, is archaic because the horse has been a relation of ours for so long, but, but we still talk about breaking horses and we don't break horses in this, this country. They still do in other parts of the world, but we don't. We gentle horses into doing things for us. And, and yet, from outside of the horse sphere, hearing that a horse has been broken in, it probably doesn't sound very good. Mm -hmm. So I do think sometimes examining the way, the language we use, the way we talk about things, and whether some of the things that we cling on to really are necessary for us to carry on enjoying uh, working with and, and competing horses. Thank you for that. Uh, Sarah, I've got one for you here. Um, how do we unite opinions from different age groups if we're all using different platforms to share information? Well, I think, um, I think you just listened to Radio 2. From, no, that's a very obvious plug. Do apologise. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, I guess sometimes it's, it's healthier to... Put the screens away to put the phones away and to just actually sit around the table and to communicate and to try and get uh, across your opinions rather than relying completely on social media um i guess yeah I, that's the answer of the day that one sarah i think 
That was um, a ter- yeah, that was a terrible answer. I do apologise. <laughs> you got a laugh here anyway. Can but... I just apologise as well to Sarah? I made a Radio Four analogy, and I apologise. I didn't mention. I didn't name check Radio Two. So I'd just like to put that on public record. <laughs> no, I, lo- I love just the minute myself as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got one for you here, Mariano. How important is it that key messages and educational materials are developed in country or within culture? For example, how relevant is a pony club handbook in Central America? Yeah, a good question. Yes, I think it's it's completely important. We have to to uh, think in the context with where we are. Uh, delivering the education and um, uh, I, I completely agree with with the way in which we should use language and also the way in which we we uh, we should um, yes deliver the information according with with the um, um, uh, with the conditions in the context where we are working many people couldn't know uh, the all we know in Mexico about about ponies is that that they are small horses, smaller than um, I don't know five hands, and 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 what I know from the people from uh, uh, United States or England is that is that a pony is that horse uh, shorter than than um, uh, one point forty five centimeters, and many people in Mexico have have horses. Uh, shorter than that and they don't think that it's a pony they is that it's a horse then it's a good example yes we should produce information for the context and 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 according with with the practices the people have there and according with uh, for example professionals will uh, will see when they are outside uh, just uh, and a good example is that in many veterinary schools we are training people in sport horses, when what they will find out there to work is working equids. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and one from our, one of our YouTube uh, viewers, as, as well, we've got plenty from YouTube here, but one for you, Cami. Um, science is often not a go to source of information for many horse owners. How can we get scientific findings out into the mainstream, do you think, in a trusted way? So I am heavily involved with International Society for Equitation Science and have been since 2005. And that is something we've been struggling with pretty much from the start. Um, We try with every abstract for every conference to have a layperson message. We have uh, made a history of having all of our proceedings available on our website. But there are so many scientific articles that the average horse owner, even the the really uh, forward thinking horse owner, they may not have um, access. You know, those of us that work at universities, we just assume that everybody has access to any any referee journal article they might wanna find. Uh, And so there are some people out there that do an amazing job with translational science, trying to get these findings to the layperson audience. And I think we just have to really keep pushing on that idea of translating the science to people that can actually put it to use. Thank you. Here's an interesting one. Um, I'll put this to you, Chris, if I may. Um, Shouldn't we listen to the people passionate about animal rights as they'll be championing how we might strive to evolve our norm for the benefit of animal welfare overall? Does that make sense? Doesn't that doesn't make sense at all? I misread it. I think. I, do you know what I think there is? Runner say is human rights as well. Be challenging how we might strive to evolve our norm for the benefit of animal welfare overall. Um, avoid that one. Let's uh, come up with another one. Uh, excuse me. I mis I misread that completely. Um, that was the best asked question of the day. That mine. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Sarah, for that. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, come, <laughs> I'll come up with another one. Um, right, how much of sharing our opinions is actually about performative outrage? 
to impact horse welfare, do you have to have a stage for performative outrage or can horse advocacy be more meaningful? That's a pretty deep one. Yeah, I mean... I... <laughs> <laughs> Panel, thank you very much yeah. indeed. It's been a wonderful... <laughs> I'm running out of questions yeah, here that, that I understand. Oh, yeah. Any other business? <laughs> I think a, a life's a performance. Everybody, everybody has to realise that. I mean, I've of, uh, often, when I say that to students, they often go, oh, but don't you need to be yourself? And you go, well, no, because if I was myself all the time, then I'd take that row that I had with my wife at breakfast and, and give it to every client I had that day, <laughs> which is not what they're paying for. So, so you, we always have to reset ourselves and, and our mindset. I, I'm, I think what they're getting at there is, do we, do we have to go to the extremes to get attention? Is that, is that I think that's what, that's what I was reading. Where it's, it, yeah. where it's yeah. getting to. Um, I think, I think going back to, to one of my previous answers, you know, we do probably have to identify the oi bit. You know, we do have to get people's attention. And you go through World Horse Welfare um, uh, literature and you'll see the before and after pictures. And, and frankly, a lot of the before pictures are shocking. And that's sort of the point, really, because, because you want to draw people in to what's going on. But then, then there is a gentler way of dealing with people. And... Um, it's probably more likely to nudge them to change their opinion than, than fronting up and, and constantly trying to find the sort of battleground, really, which is just going to entrench people. So, so I'm not sure I agree with the question, but I don't know. Fully well, I'm not sure that I agree or disagree if I understand the question. But anyway, um, there's one here which I just think might be relevant for you, Mariano, if I may just give you this last one to you. Um, how can we balance opinions regarding action and research for working equids between people in countries with working equids and those from the West who have better access to funding? Did you get that? How can we balance opinion regarding action and research for working equids between those countries that have working equids and those from the West who have better access to funding? Well, thank you. Good, good question. Um, um, I have another another anecdote for to answer that question. We were in a community where there was a high uh, prevalence of of white line disease in the donkeys. Then we we were investigating why uh, we knew what type of microbes were involved in the problem, etc. And we were having a conversation with the people. Then suddenly, a very strong. <laughs> um, um, opinion came from from a, an old man and he said something like stop the bullshit yeah uh, with all you are bringing today is is, is that uh, the, the 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 donkeys with y line is uh, are those donkeys which are shot when you don't do not shoot the donkeys they have no wildlife disease then we said okay what a good opportunity to do a um to design um a story and to test that. And we did design a thesis for a student and we did test the, what, the, what that man, man said that day. And, and yes, it was because the shoes were too small for the donkeys and, and they were nailing on the, on the white line. And then we started to pay attention on, on horses with white line or working horses with white line disease. And those horses were using also small shoes because that type of shoe had been developed perhaps 300 years ago with smaller horses and now with bigger horses coming from United States, quarter horses, the shoe was so small for the horses. Then for me, that's, that we, uh, we did a project with, with no funds and, and, and we just uh, uh, produced a thesis for a student and perhaps that study would have been published in a, in a journal, a very important journal in English, but um, perhaps we didn't uh, invest the time on that and, and perhaps uh, we didn't think that it was a good contribution for the science of the white line disease in, in, in the world um, then uh, yes it's 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 a problem uh, sometimes we we have no access to funds to do research uh, good research for the welfare and performance of, of equities in our countries because 
the governments uh, regard them non-productive animals. Then they say those who have horses or donkeys, they if they have a, 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 a tool to work, and this is like like, like a luxury thing. Then the, you you don't find very easily funds, and you have to rely rely on funds coming from other countries. And well, uh, we are very lucky that we we can be uh, supported by that. And uh, but the what I my opinion is just like that man contributed to our knowledge that day, to our science on equity in our country that day. We all uh, uh, should work together, uh, 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 not not between persons but between countries, and 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 rely one on each other to to produce that type of knowledge which will of science which will help the the welfare of the equids and which will provide the evidence to come back to the communities and probably to tell that man yes you are right <laughs> he knows he is right but perhaps his people uh, uh, doesn't uh, or don't rely on them on him a lot and then we could come with that evidence and we all would work together and that could be done between countries Sorry for the long answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> but a relevant one. Thank you very much indeed, Mariano. May I take the opportunity of thanking all, all five of you. Thank you so much to you, Chris, to Neil, Mariano, Cammy, and Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you very much indeed, and um, apologies for misunderstanding some, misunderstanding some of the questions. Um, very thought-provoking discussion uh, from a very informed panel, um, and how we need to look at our opinions and how they can be used constructively. Uh, keep the conversation going with, on social media, that's two words again, hashtag whose opinions matter. Um, now we'd like to pose one final question to our audience, um, and this is this, it's um, when considering equine welfare, whose opinion really matters? Now, please give one answer, a maximum of two words. Two words when considering equine welfare, whose opinion really matters? Uh, and we'll create a word cloud out of your answers, which we'll reveal uh, pretty shortly. Um, now, while you're considering that question, we have the pleasure of hearing the perspective of World Horse Welfare's president on the issues we've been exploring today. I'm delighted to introduce Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. Thank you. Uh, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, well, you rather hope I'm not going to go back over all the speakers, but uh, can I say what a pleasure it is to welcome you here, um, those here at the RGS and those who've joined us in our rather sort of weird hybrid fashion. Um, which I still find quite difficult to get to grips with, but I'm very impressed by our participants today for coping so well with that and adding hugely uh, to the debate we've had today. And I do think the, the subject of opinions and, and how they matter and the rather interesting definition uh, of opinions, um, which appear to contradict each other in, in, in some weird way. It was all right if it was a professional opinion, meant something, but if it was just an opinion, didn't really. Um, but not being able to judge quite where that sits in terms of uh, what we feel about an opinion and uh, what an impact it has. And of course, opinions don't come with responsibilities, do they? Perhaps that's the key to this. Is that you can. You can offer opinions, but actually you're not responsible for anything that comes out of that. It makes it slightly different. And these conferences are the opportunity for just exactly that, opinions, um, on the way in which we regard our role. And I'm grateful for all our speakers and the organizers, which I think has been an, an excellent and, and very informative conference, in, delivered as it is in a new way. Um, I rather wish that our um, contribution from OIE had actually been in French. I might have stood a marginally better chance um, <laughs> of understanding it, but it could have had subtitles. I don't practice that much, but I'm, I can cope. Um, but it, it kind of takes us back, that world of communication, doesn't it? It takes us back to the origins of World Horse Welfare and Ada Cole's ability um, to communicate, because there was a lady who had 
think you could describe it as strong opinions. And she used uh, those opinions to influence positive change for horses. So our definition of opinions, if we applied it to Ada Cole, uh, would be strong opinions, which she followed up. But she followed up, very importantly, on a, on a very focused group of horses. So they were working horses. They were horses that, that were directly linked to human survival. Never mind theirs, but they were about farms, transport, military, things that couldn't be done any other way. If you did not have horses, you could not uh, achieve uh, the sort of survivability that humans had got used to. So they were important parts of uh, our civilization and society. That is very job related. But she did highlight that contradiction at the time as things were changing dramatically between the importance of horses to the lives of the average Briton and how they were treated by them when they reached the end of the road and they were no longer useful. And many of those would be shipped off to slaughter in, in far from ideal conditions. And she did wonder how people could take pride in the treatment of their horses uh, at one stage when they were working for them, uh, but not afterwards. And she did ask the question, how could they do that, continue to take pride, unless their welfare was considered from birth to death? And we still have that issue, as, as Rowley reminded us. In other countries, that problem still exists. That working relationship, uh, if, you, if you can't take pride in that relationship from birth to death, and that's something that uh, we add into the work that we do and the ethos, it's not just an opinion, it's ethos of what we do, is adding that in as a very important part. But Ada's opinions were backed up with hard evidence. And we remind ourselves of that because it is so important. Because she needed to demonstrate the accuracy of her opinions, the accuracy of her views on what was happening to British working horses when they left their farms, transport industry, the military. She monitored ports. She established a network of reliable information gatherers. She studied transport logs and government statistics. Uh, in, in a way, if you think about that in terms of no technology, that was a huge undertaking. But she, used, she gathered the evidence and used that to influence and persuade figures of the time to support her demand that infirm horses were never not exported for slaughter. And they did together persuade the British government to change the law to prevent the indiscriminate export of horses for slaughter. And she recommended a humane abattoir for horses in Lincolnshire, but that was to ensure that there was indeed an outlet for those horses that would stop them having to endure those long journeys uh, to France or Belgium and would be treated with care and respect to the end. And given some of the information we've had and the issues that have been raised this year, um, some things never go away. We, standards change, uh, roles have changed, well, certainly roles in the equine world and the work-related aspect. They now play a very important part for us in leisure, uh, in therapy, and, and in sport, and, and however you define that. But the care and the responsibility from birth to death doesn't go away. And equally, the rather um, thorny problem of um, slaughter remains an issue, and it should be as easy and as um, financially viable as possible. Because I think we all realize that the loss of abattoirs has been uh, a major impact on those who might otherwise have used um, perfectly good uh, facilities to slaughter their horses once they knew they were no longer viable, but can't afford to do that um, because there are so few. Still an issue. I think with the technology we have available, we should be able to follow up Ada Cole's research slightly more quickly. But today, of course, we still gather the evidence which supports research, and that does continue to inform through its recommendations imp to improve the welfare of horses, not just here, 
but around the world. And we've done a lot of that through collaboration and outreach and understanding the cultures and traditions of the countries in which they work and which they are still an essential part of their lives. We, over the years, have made that impact because we recognize how important it is to be able to have that conversation, to understand the environments in which they work, and to adapt the knowledge that we have uh, to make it relevant and understandable. I have to go back to Eglin Tanjeb, who said that the work that we should do should be understandable, repeatable, and affordable. And for World Horse Welfare, it's exactly the same. It's no good going out and telling people that, oh, you can't do it this way. This is all wrong. If they don't, if you can't explain to them why the difference it will make is also for your life, and how you can go on repeating it, and how you can afford it, you're not doing them any favors in the long run. So disseminating information, education, owning animals, horses, just the same of all kinds, it's a lifelong learning process. It never stops. And those of you who have owned possibly horses, but more than one, will have discovered that every single one has different problems. You never stop learning. I'm slightly bored with still challenging the veterinary profession with things they've never seen before, but that's, um, <laughs> and no doubt they find it very entertaining. Um, but the education has to rely on the ability to get it out in a form which is accurate and reliable for those who are receiving it. And that goes back to the discussion about social media and the access to those um, formats that can reach more people but have to do it in a reliable way and they can, it is clearly identified as being reliable. And we also know that, oddly enough, this pandemic has, has, has proved a number of things. One is that more people can work online than they ever thought could do before. Some charities have found it uh, an enormous encouragement to what they do because they've discovered they've got more supporters than they thought they'd ever had before and they've been able to con communicate with them. But for others, it has hugely increased the amount of information that they are ex have access to. And they haven't found a way of discovering which of that is the, the reliable information that they really need to make up their minds. And that, it, it, this challenge is the good and the bad of what technology can do for you. And I think today's debate has helped, maybe helped quite a lot of people work out how that uh, can be done better. But we shouldn't ignore the fact that it offers uh, huge opportunities, particularly in disseminating the information, results of research, good education uh, to all who are interested in world horse welfare and in all matters related to the horse. So how, for this, for world horse welfare, we have to continue to do that. And we have to continue to inform and influence changes. Some of that remains the same. Transport is still an issue. And we look at just here in the UK, England, Wales, Scotland, and the EU. We have to in make sure that these are connected, understood, and clearly understood, and work quickly and easily. Uh, it must be a welfare contradiction to have sets of rules that keeps animals in boxes, horse boxes, transport, by the side of the road, or in a, it doesn't really matter where, on a, car park for hours, that is a welfare issue. That's not how your regulation should be working. There has to be a better way of doing it. And we need to make sure that our uh, is, is evidence-based and the research backs up those recommendations. And history also, I've just been talking about Ada Cole, also reflects on, on our commissioning of a four-year research project uh, with the Royal Veterinary College and Bristol University on equine welfare at slaughter to help inform guidelines for those good practices to be used not just here, but globally. That will be a challenge in itself, again, because of the differences uh, for, around the world. But understanding the subject properly and having done your research well, 
you will be able, we will be able to help more people avoid some of our own pitfalls. Attitudes change, don't they? They change expectations and they change perspective. And we have to be there with the arguments which remind people that some things remain the same, the basics of welfare remain the same. And the challenge of fulfilling the, the expectations in how we uh, define those basics in the future uh, remain the same. We've got to continue to do that. Um, I, perhaps technology also introduces another slightly difficult concept, which is the single issue group. And getting those single issue groups to see a holistic um, issue around horses is, is also a problem. I would argue that doctors have the same problem. Many of them deal with conditions and diagnoses, very individual. Quite a challenge for them to see an individual patient at the end of that, who may behave quite differently given the series of, uh, of diagnoses. And maybe the same is true with horses. We have to be careful that we still see them holistically, not just as an animal, but where they live, how they live, and um, dare I say it, their opinions. Um, <laughs> Some of them, I'm sure you've all had them. It's just that argument, isn't it, about you can't make a horse jump, shouldn't do that. Um, I got given a horse that chose which field it wanted to stay in. <laughs> Absolutely no encouragement or interest from anybody else, and it crossed six fences before it decided that that field was the one it was going to stay in. Um, so opinion, probably yes. Um, just look out for those who've got real opinions, because they're difficult to deal with. Um, thank you all, though, for coming today. Not all of you probably own horses, or, but are interested in, in what World Horse Welfare can do for the equids of this world, and that's important. You don't have to own horses to be interested in that. It has to be well-informed. And I don't think you should ignore those with experience, because that does is still a very important part of the equation. So I hope today's conference will have influenced, confirmed your opinions out there, and possibly even your funds, um, which will make it possible for World Horse Welfare to continue to make a real difference around the world. So thank you very much for joining us again today. Thank you, ma'am. It's always a pleasure to hear your insightful perspective. Um, now I'd like to ask uh, World Horse Welfare Chief Executive Roly Owers back to the stage for a quick summing up. Roly. Thank you, Mike. Your Royal Highness, my Lord, ladies and gentlemen, we are late, so we, I will be extraordinarily brief. Whose opinion matters? I take you back to the start. Your opinion matters, because opinions, as we've been discussing today, really do influence the future. We shouldn't focus on a negative, but we shouldn't ignore the negative easier e either. I'm very mindful of what Nick said, what our president said, around um, the OIE Director General's presentation. It wasn't easy to hear that feedback, but what you can do is turn it into a positive, and I will make sure that her talk, her really valuable talk, will be put up online on our website after today. So you can turn a negative into a positive. The secondly thing I would say is self-discipline. I heard a few times today, don't look at your social media before you go to bed. How many of us do look at our social media before we go to bed? And the idea of actually before competition or anything, a big, big moment in your life, not looking at your social media for three days before may be a really good thing. What have you got to lose without trying that? And thirdly, around the whole issue of conflict. Now, of course, we should base our everything on science, but there is a saying that 90% of conflict is how people deliver a message, not the content of the message, which is only 10%. But I think there is a real kernel of truth in that. It's how we speak to one another. We need to be compassionate and understanding, whether you are offline 
or online. And then we'll finish with Nick. I love the idea of someone liking Nick because he looks like he's been to a good party. I hope you've had a good day today um, and we could go and party whether you're at home, your drinks cabinet and your coffee table is closer, but if you're here, you're welcome to join us for lunch. Thank you so much for joining us today. And there's the result of our little, our poll. Perception, the professionals, industry experts, my vet, <laughs> informed owners, public, a vet, your vet, <laughs> everyone, very good. Uh, farriers, practical experience, informed expert, you get the sort of picture. Thank you so much everybody for attending virtually and in person today. Um, thank you to our panelists and our presenters and to you, ma'am, in particular. We've covered a lot of ground today. Um, please share this event with your friends and colleagues. Uh, we'd like to thank our generous sponsor, uh, uh, Sir Peter O'Sullivan Charitable Trust, for making today possible, and the Horse Race Betty Levy Board, as well as the MSDM Animal Health. That's the end of our hybrid conference of 2021, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for attending and uh, have a safe journey to your next destination. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you.